thank you everyone for being here um and thank you so much to um gregory moss for, for being here uh we have today the possibility to discuss uh, his book uh, and it is the book uh, that we awarded with the hegel pd prize uh, the title of the book is hegel's foundation Sorry, <laughs> so it was Foundation Free Metaphysics, The Logic of Singularity. And the chair of the event today is Elena Tripaldi. And thank you very much, Elena, for organizing not only the workshop in the uh, last two days, but today's event too. Thank you very much. And I will give you the floor. Yes, okay. Welcome also from the side to the Egan PD Prize Book Symposium. I will briefly say a few things on what it is uh, the Egan PD Prize and then introduce our speaker and winner of uh, Egan PD Prize, Gregory Moss. Egan PD Prize is a prize that we award, Egan PD Research Group awards to the most interesting book that we believe has appeared in the preceding two years. Of course, we don't do that with the ambition of awarding the most interesting, absolute, in the absolute uh, um, book uh, or article uh, appeared in those two previous years, but the criteria is also a book that has sparked most discussion within our research group. And then every year we invite the winner to discuss their ideas with us. And last year's winner uh, was Professor Gregory Moss, who is Associate Professor uh, for Philosophy at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, his book, who won Egel PD Prize, is Egel's Foundation Free Metaphysics, The Logic of Singularity. Today, Professor Moss will give a lecture entitled Gerbrich Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel's Monism on the Singularity and Freedom of the Concept. After the lecture, we will have a brief discussion and then some um, papers to introduce, introduce the discussion on the book. Uh, Professor Moss, you have the floor. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you so much for organizing the whole, the whole group for, well, first for reading the book at all, or give, opening it and giving it a chance. And I'm really happy that it started a conversation. Uh, I think that's uh, what the best and worst philosophy can do. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. It was a wonderful opportunity for me to come to Padua for the first time. And uh, I hope it will not be the last, uh, the last time. Okay, so my apologies. This book is uh, 500 pages. <laughs> and I also want to apologize to all of you, any of you who tried to read it for the link. Um, and I want to talk about the book. But it's already been three years since I published it, and I already feel some otherness. Here. So I I will give a talk, kind of outlining the main arguments and ideas in the book. For those who haven't read it, I hope to kind of streamline it. For those who have read it, I'm sorry that you'll hear it again, but hopefully you'll uh, hear at least some of the main arguments taken out of the, the long historical exegesis. Uh, it's about one hour. So if you have to get up and go restroom or get some coffee, that's fine. I will be okay. All right. So we started. Philosophy seeks absolute knowledge. The task of philosophy, as Fichte so eloquently articulated it in his 1804 Wissenschaftslehre, consists in the presentation of the absolute. Because the absolute is all encompassing and nothing exceeds it, it is relative to nothing else. That philosophy seeks the absolute means that philosophy pursues knowledge of that which transcends all relativity. Many contemporary philosophers may find Fichte's proposition to be totally incredulous. Indeed, you might imagine that while philosophers in the 19th century may have been saddled with this onerous burden, philosophy in the 21st century can in principle do without the absolute. However, if our philosophical critic denies that philosophy is able to know the absolute, and restricts philosophy to something relative, whatever it may be, being a structure of experience, we would not be unjustified in raising the following question. If philosophy ought to be restricted to a form of relative knowing, our philosophical critic would be making a claim about the relative character of philosophical inference. As Wittgenstein noted in the Tractatus, to meaningfully draw such a limit, the philosopher must know what they mean to exclude from the proper domain of the philosophy. Since the critic can only draw the limit 
philosophical knowing by knowing what is beyond the limit and the absolute lies beyond the limit of philosophical knowing our philosophical critic must inevitably make a claim about absolute knowing in their discourse in other words for philosophy to know itself as a relative inquiry into a relative object philosophy must be able to think the difference between the relative if one were to posit a difference, an absolute difference between the relative and the absolute, one would be raising that difference to an absolute status. The German idealists learn the unintended lessons of Kant's critique of pure reason. One cannot limit knowing to what is conditioned without overstepping those limits. One may offer a milder critique of Fichte's invention by positing the absolute as one of many possible, though contingent, objects of philosophical inquiry. Because all domains would fall into either the necessary domain or the contingent one, such a difference would indirectly transform the difference between the contingency and necessity into an absolute. In short, any attempt to restrict the scope of philosophical inquiry to what is only relative would only work to expand it into the absolute. I don't need to do all of them on that. Thus, no philosophy can restrict the scope of philosophical inquiry to what is relative without presenting the absolute and indirectly invoking the absolute. Indeed, one could not proclaim that all domains are relative to others without elevating relativity to an absolute status. Simply put, Fichte is not wrong. Philosophy is wedded to absolute inquiry. It cannot be indifferent to the Henkai Pan of the two big and three. Against all Kantian protestations, German idealism teaches us that the absolute must appear. Some of the most iconic texts of the German idealist tradition have shown a system of transcendental idealism the Hegel's phenomenology of spirit attempt to fulfill Fisch's call to present the absolute. In short, the absolute exists, but every meaningful denial of its existence inadvertently reaffirms it. One cannot expunge the absolute from philosophical experience without simultaneously inviting it back in through the back door. And given that philosophy itself calls us to affirm the existence of the absolute as the proper object of philosophical theory and philosophical experience, the question is not whether the absolute appears, it does. The question is how does it appear? Philosophy, for its part, seeks the logos of the absolute or the world by means of the logos of all. In other words, philosophy seeks conceptual knowledge of the absolute. And this is only possible if the absolute itself is conceptual. Were the absolute non conceptual, no philosophical concept could, in principle, correspond to the absolute, and philosophy would fail to possess any true concepts. To truly conceive the absolute, the concept must in principle be unified with the absolute. To match one's concept with the absolute already presupposes truth in the absolute itself, that the absolute is constituted by a unity of concept. The correspondence of the concept with being must be a form of self-correspondence of the concept with itself. Again, the Fichte of 1804, I've been reading this recently, sorry, summarizes this point well. Philosophy seeks to articulate neither being nor thought on their own, but the oneness of being. So that's part one. Part two, the problem of absolute knowing from postmodernism to real realism. According to the principle of non-contradiction, as we find in Hegel, no concept can be both itself and its negation. A cannot be A and not A. In the tradition of Western philosophy, this principle, in its various formulations, though not all the same, has guided our reflections on absolute knowing. However, as long as the PNC, principle of non contradiction is presumed to have privileged absolute status, the absolute can neither exist nor be known. The absolute ought to be what is all encompassing and therefore ought to exclude the other. As such, the absolute is not relevant. If all conceptual knowledge is governed by the, P, by the PNC, to conceive of the absolute by means of concepts, the absolute must not find the principle. However, by employing the PNC to know the absolute, the absolute must be restrained to one side of a contradictory opposition. Because it must follow the PNC, the absolute cannot be what is not absolute. It cannot be relevant. But since the absolute is forced to occupy one side of an opposition, everything relative must then be conceived as other to the absolute. Because it is known by finite or relative conceptuality and thereby reduced to one side of an opposition, the absolute becomes one relative being that exists relative to other relative beings. Thus, the absolute is not absolute. It is relative to another and is not the all-encompassing one and all, the Henkai. 
the absolute is not relative, thus it's relative, thus it's not uh, an absolute. This thesis generates the problem of the third man, first raised in Plato's Parmenides, as an objection to young Socrates' theory of forms. Because the absolute is relative now to relativity, there is no absolute. There are only two relative beings, the relative absolute and the relative. And with the disappearance of the first absolute, the second absolute must appear. Since both relative absolute and the relative instantiate relativity, relativity now appears as the second absolute. However, the second absolute is not the relative instances. Thus, the second absolute is relative to. It's relative to those instances and is therefore not absolute. The absolute absconds into infinity always one step ahead of us. Since any attempt to think the absolute by means of concepts transforms the concept into that which is not absolute, every attempt to conceptualize the absolute leads to a contradiction. Since the PNC precludes the truth of contradictions, that is, these can't be right, no conceptualization of the absolute can be true. Now on to postmodernism, something you didn't think I was going to talk about. <laughs> by this line of reasoning, we can motivate some important aspects in the continental philosophy, such as postmodernism, and new realism. Since every concept of the absolute relativizes it, it is not unreasonable at all to infer that the absolute cannot be known. Say one of the dog bills of the Chinese century. Derrida's difference is constituted by the contradiction that arises in absolute knowing. It's the absolute that is outside itself. Given that difference is the absolute outside itself, difference is a movement constituted by two sides, occurring and different. Qua different from itself or outside itself, the content of difference is outside of difference. In another content, content difference star. This difference refers its content to the other. Further, given that difference star is that content that is originally referred to difference, it is also, it is itself also that which is outside itself. Thus, even difference star is outside itself and must have its content deferred to another content, difference double star ad infinitum. Thus, difference is infinitely outside itself. It is Hegel's bad infinity, an infinity that always has one more, an infinity that is inherently infinite. This deferral structure, which is evident in the differential structure of semiotics, could not be more evident than it is here. What is more difference involves difference. It is different from itself. Because it is different from itself, it defers what it is. Difference is the difference that defers. I'm sorry, I'm using some very dull language in sophomore. Every time you think the absolute is here, it's not here, but there. It's that which is always delayed. Our desire to encounter difference is persistently delayed. It constantly delays and postpones the fulfillment of our desire for complete unity. Accordingly, it leaves us with an unquenchable thirst and unfulfillable desire for the absolute. This exceeding itself exceeds without end. Derrida will say that difference is a movement without rest, without a final term, never becomes determinate. Negations are untotalizable. It's irreducibly polysemic. The absence of the absolute in consciousness, Derrida will describe as hell. And it says it undergoes torture. I don't like this. Like, I see how you could end up in hell. But I don't want to live in hell. So, I don't think we have to. To escape the hell of postmodernism, the new realists and other kindred spirits offer their own unique solution. For the new realists, there cannot be any trace of the absolute because the absolute does not exist. By ceasing to desire it, we are not tortured by, by its absence because it, there's nothing there to torture us. The absolute is all encompassing and relative to nothing. Being as such is an absolute category, each being instantiates X is, Y is, Z is, etc. However, each determinate being is different from others and is thereby relative to other beings. Absolute being is relative to nothing, but determinate beings are relative to each other. So just as the absolute is not relative, being itself is not a determinate being. As Marcus Gabriel observes, because being is not a determinate being, it is in relation to beings insofar as it excludes them. So how does this lead us to the no-world position, to the no-absolute position? The mutual exclusion of being from determinate beings is a relationship constituted by negation. Insofar as it is constituted by negation, being itself is positioned vis-a-vis -vis beings and is thereby transformed into a determinate being. Being with position, Daza. The very proclamation that being is not a determinate being transforms being into a determinate thing. In the very same way, because the absolute is not relative, it is transformed into something else. 
as a determinate being, the absolute being itself excludes others and exists in relation to them. Although we attempt to discover something that exists without restriction, and every thought about an unrestricted totality or totality disappears. In its stead, we discover a being, not being itself. Since being or the absolute can never be a being, and conceiving of being always relativizes it, we are inevitably led to posit that to exist is to be relative to something. Something else, what Gabriel says to appear in the field of sense, just to be in a context, to appear in a context. This is the problem of ontotheology, the mythical problem. And the problem of a rich heritage from Meister Eckhart to Kant and Heidegger. It's not Heidegger's invention. If being really is absolute, it's all encompassing and cannot be relative. As such, it is always other to beings and thereby as a particular determinant. Being can never be a being, but is always only transformed into a being. The experience of absolute thinking is constituted by the perpetual absconding of the absolute. In one stroke, we can simultaneously see the relativity of existence and the non being of being. What always disappears in the argument is being itself. In every act of withdrawal, what always appears in the place of absolute being is some relative being. In the experience of thinking, relative beings do not disappear, only the absolute does. Note that the absolute disappears because we assume the absolute cannot be absolute while at the same time appearing to thought as a relative. Part three, absolute value theism. We're going to get to Hegel at some point. Because why, why Hegel matters to me. This is also my thought. Well, I already wrote the book, so why do you With attacks on all sides from postmodernism to new realism, is there any recourse left to friends of the absolute? There is tokens. Only, however, I would contend if we remember an important lesson from our Christian heritage, or from mine and Hegel's anyway, namely that the death of the absolute is only a prelude to its resurrection. The experience of thinking that awakens us to the death of the absolute is the very same that awakens us to its resurrection. Through the failure to conceptualize the absolute, the philosopher experiences the absence of the absolute. However, what has disappeared is not the true absolute. What has disappeared is a one-sided absolute, an infinitude that excludes finitude, its own relativity. In that very experience of the disappearance of all infinite, the true infinite appears before us. In the failure to conceptualize the absolute, we experience opposing and mutually exclusive categories falling into the unity. The absolute falls into the relative. The absolute being cannot be differentiated from anything. This experience of the absolute is an experience of the absolute that no longer excludes its non-being, relativity, but is constituted by its own negation. Accordingly, I hold that the absolute exists and that it can be known because I encountered in the absolute contradiction to situate on absolute thinking. The absolute is only absolute if it's also relative. It can't be absolute without, well, if it excludes relativity. So the absolute is in kind of as absolute in its very relative. Here we encounter the arrightness of the absolute. The absolute as a unity of opposition is experienced in virtue of the collapse of the absolute into the relative. We experience the absolute in the very vanishing of categories into contradictions. Accordingly, just at the point where the danger is greatest and being recedes from our conceptual grasp, the saving of power arises. The death of the absolute must die, the negation must be made, a new life born is born from. This insight is not due to a chance encounter or a stroke of luck, we're not having mystical experiences on the mountain, but that's fine too. To the contrary, Hegel teaches us it is born from a careful attentiveness to the self-referential character of concepts and its content. By applying the concept to itself, the concept negates itself. The absolute is absolute. If this is true, the absolute is not relative. If it is not relative, then it is other than the relative and is thereby relative. The absolute is absolute and thereby transcends relativity. However, rather than negate its absolute character, the relativity of the absolute ensures its absolute character, for it can only be absolute if it is not other to than its relative. Hence, because the absolute is absolute, it is not absolute. It is relative. The true absolute does not disappear. It preserves itself in the persistence of the contradiction or as the contradiction. The absolute is absolute and not absolute. And that itself is an absolute truth. It is consistent with itself only insofar as it is not consistent with itself. Hegel himself will claim that contradiction is self-contradiction, such that it excludes itself from itself. 
sich selbst von sich selbst aus zu schließen. This self-exclusion is an absolute contradiction, absoluter Widerspruch. Through self-referential predication, the concept negates itself and stands in the contradiction of itself. However, in virtue of that very self-contradiction, it remains true to itself. So absolute dialetism is this term that I coined in the book, but all it means is that the absolute exists and it exists as a true contradiction. And in short, the truth of absolute dialetism can be experienced through the method of self-referential conceiving, a method that is exoteric, exo, not essence. And available to anybody with the will and the desire. Okay, uh, two, two species of absolute dialetism. Absolute dialetism may appear to be a single path, but I don't think it is. This is, I think, a central concept in the book. Because the concept can never have absolute truth if the P and C remains in force, two paths appear possible. Each of these paths are species of the same genus. They are species of the same generic solution to the problem of the disappearance of the absolute. The first option, the Western tradition might have been fundamentally misguided by supposing that the PNC and the correlated concept of explosive contradiction is a necessary and essential feature of constitutive form. If this is the case, the absolute can be salvaged by denying that the PNC governs just conceptual determinism. Alternatively, if the PNC governs all conceptual determinacy, then the contradictory status of the absolute would indicate that the absolute is beyond all conceptual determinacy. This species of absolute dialectism is what I call mystical dialectism. Within mystical dialectism, there are rational and transrational approaches. This may seem surprising. While one form of mystical dialectism affirms the intellectual news as a transconceptual faculty by which the absolute is known, such as Matruza, other forms argue that no form of transconceptual intellection, the noose, can fully grasp the mind of God, such as uh, Thomasino's early Rather than give up on conceptual knowledge of the absolute, philosophy might instead rethink the very structure of conceptual knowledge. We can think the domain of conceptual determinacy by denying the PNC is a necessary structural condition of the truth of concepts. Or argue that the absolute transcends conceptual form exactly because the PNC governs the domain of conceptual So these are the two options that I that I offer here. The absolute contradiction is a conceptual truth, or it transcends all conceptual truth. Within the former conception of the absolute contradiction as a conceptual truth, there are generally two methods of proceeding. Maybe more, but these are the two that I came up with. In contemporary philosophy, we have Philosophers like Grant Priest and his Paraphysics of Logic, or other forms of Andrew's dialectic theory of truth that have called into question dogmatic approaches to the PNC and its interpretation. On the other, um, on the one hand, Priest has argued that one can move beyond traditional logic to formal grounds of mind. In everything and nothing, this came out last year, I argue that Priest should be committed to a form of absolute dialectic. On the other hand, Hegel's dialectical logic in the science of logic develops a non-formal truth logic of the absolute. As Hegel writes, speculative thoughts consist solely of holding on to the contradiction of the absolute itself, compared to minimizing the force of the second, only talking towards the second. So I fear you all know your Hegel type of disciple. Um, that's not always true, but I like this. Both Hegel and Priest reject the principle of explosion and argue that there can be true contradictions. While Priest will conceive of the contradiction as, the, as something like the claim that some proposition P is both true and false, for Hegel, the contradiction is the self contradiction of the concept of itself. Moreover, the form of Priest's logic by which he defends his theory of truth is formal, or Hegel's is not. The most common response to the problem of absolute knowledge, however, lies in a completely different direction than Jason Priest or Jason Eel or Kevin. Rather, in Western philosophy, the most common solution problem in the tradition, and in Hegel's own time, I think, is the second species, namely some variety of mysticism, which proclaims the absolute to transcend conceptual truth. The second species of absolute idealism, the view that the absolute exists, that transcends conceptual determination, cannot help but be propounded by Locke. Given that all conceptual attempts to know the absolute must fail, the articulations of the mystic too must fail. Thus, the mystic can demonstrate the truth of the position, only through the self negation of all the implicit concepts. The position is most clearly evident in Cruz's vision of God, in which God is both contradictory and transcends all 
of price, he declares that a view reaffirms contradiction with most truth, and yet this, quote, coincidence of opposites is beyond the grasp of reason. All right, formalism and this. Hegel's argument for the inconsistent character of the absolute appears to follow from the symposium scheme, whereby the self-referential predication of the absolute to itself engenders a contradictory self-transcendence. To think the absolute, one must state the absolute as a being that stands in opposition to relativity. As such, the absolute appears as one member within the class of relative beings. This is the element of closure. Everything is enclosed in relativity. However, it is also the case that the absolute cannot be one relative being, for it is relative to nothing. Thus, the absolute must transcend the class of being. This is the element of transcendence. The self referential relation of the absolute to itself places it simultaneously beyond this total set of relative beings and within it. Hence, via the enclosure scheme of philosophy and successfully grasp the absolute as true contradiction. Despite the attractive character of this supposed schema, it is seriously constrained by its own character. While certain non classical imperative system logics may indeed allow the possibility of contradiction, they are not suitable for absolute knowing. Formal logic abstracts from the content of concepts of proposition and argument. And among other things, this withdrawal enables the formal logician to know the inner universal structure of valid argumentation irrespective of the content of the argument. However, the universality achieved by formalization undermines the possibility of knowledge. This is just classic Hegel. Because it abstracts from content, one cannot deduce the content of the form. Such logic therefore is relative. It excludes the content which it applies. In order to apply to any content, the formal logician must appeal to a principle distinct from the logic itself, such as experience or nature or something else, divine revelation. Hence, formal logics can never correspond to the absolute, though something is always missing. As is evident, the problem does not lie with their consistency alone or the denial of the principle of contradiction. The problem here lies with the mere formal character. Whether it be classical or non classical, the formality is not present. The mystical approach to absolute dialectism too has its challenges. Mysticism is indeed motivated by the failure of all abstract approaches, yet by rejecting all abstract approaches, and raising up immediacy to the truth of the absolute, as I can show does the identity philosophy, mysticism also fails or falls victim to one side of thinking. Mysticism appears to treat the absolute as one side of composition. The absolute is non conceptual and eschews conceptuality. By excluding conceptuality, the absolute is not absolute, but is relative to conceptual knowing or transcendent. Rather than preserving the absolute, the mystical shrinks the absolute. To a relative individual view. Because this form of app of mysticism undermines the absolute, that is the absolute, it approaches the absolute in the same way as the conceptual. Thus, in negating the conceptual, the mystic relativizes the absolute without recovering it. The task of mystical dialectism should consist in showing how the transconceptual absolute can unfold the concrete of the same. And in the book I'm writing now, I try to develop this uh, idea. Okay, Hegel's absolute dialectism. The traditional concept of the concept. The absolute must be to deny it is to affirm it. What is more, if it does not exist in conceptual form, it cannot be absolutely absolute. So the absolute must be and it must exist in conceptual form. However, it is not enough to show the insufficiency of mysticism in formally. To justify and proclaim the absolute to be conceptually comprehensible, Hegel must rethink the concept of the self contradictory universe. Hegel's universal is not just self contradictory, it's the power of self particularization. In order to appreciate Hegel's revolutionary and revisionary accounts of the concept, we should first consider the traditional ways that concepts have been conceived and other problems that arise in the traditional world. That's why I have to go through this. Whether the concept is conceived as a genus, a set, or an abstract universal, the concepts have traditionally been conceived. And the principle of unity for the particulars. However, this principle is not sufficient to differentiate the particulars that fall under it. For example, the concept of the mammal specifies what every mammal has in common, but does not differentiate the kinds. To know what differentiates the concept mammal, one must appeal to a concept outside of this. The principle of universality is distinct from the principle of unity. This division of principles is most clearly visible in Aristotle's distinction between genus and difference, the differential, the shabbat. To know the essence of the human being, one cannot just state that he is animal, but one requires a separate principle, the difference, 
such a junction. If the concept of the mammal differentiating itself, the concept in virtue of which each particular would be instance of the mammal, would be the same as that concept would specify how each is a different mammal. Mm -hmm. However, this would be a contradiction for that concept which would be which would differentiate each species of the genus would be the same as that which would make each of them the same. However, according to the PNC, contradictions cannot be true. Since contradictions cannot be true, the principle in virtue of which particulars instantiate a class ought to be distinct from the principle in virtue of which they are different from each other. Hence, the principle of non-contradiction is the ultimate source of the division of the principles of universal. I think both Aristotle and Kant endorse the division principles at some level, and they both endorse the PNC different formulations. So I think again the former would be a positive part. On the traditional theory of conceptuality, concepts are finite. For each concept is only a principle. Not a principle of universality. So it's not. Since it's not a principle of universality, one must either appeal to another universal to differentiate the instances. Or appeal to some given non conceptual concept to differentiate the particular use of alternative names. Since the concept is not a principle of its own difference, the concept is not existentially applicable. On the traditional model, the concept is usually thought of as merely possibility, which may or may not be true. Concepts are not true by themselves, they're not instantiated in virtue of themselves alone. Because I know what a human is, it does not follow. In Kant's terms, concepts without intuitions are empty. If the concept is true of some particular, it is true of it in virtue of something else. It is not true of it only in virtue of itself. That's what I mean by being essential. Or as Shelley would teach us, the boss is distinct from the das. Stating what a concept is must be different from stating that it is. On the traditional model, concepts have relative truth. They overtruth your principle by transcendence. That's a huge difference between Shelley. Throughout the Western tradition, I'm American, I can be loud. From Plato to Kant, I'll just yell at you. Plato to Kant, um, with few exceptions, concepts are routinely conceived as finite and governed by the PNC. They are principles of unity, not sufficient principles of difference. Concepts are mere possibilities to be, possibilities that can be true, but they cannot be true in good terms. The concept is finite, for it is not fully responsible for the differentiated instantiation of each of its instances. But since the concept is true in virtue of something else, it is not true in virtue of itself alone. What is absolute is true in virtue of itself alone, and so concepts are not absolute. Since the absolute cannot be true in virtue of something else, and the concept has maybe relative truth, the form of the concept does not correspond to the absolute. Thus, it is no surprise that philosophy, wielding such imperfect tools, would fail to grasp the truth. Okay, problem of the missing difference and absolute empiricism. If these structures are taken as endemic to the concept as such, they must also apply to the concept of the concept. The concept of the concept is what all concepts have in common, in virtue of which they are concepts. Although the concept is the principle of unity, it does not differentiate its own instances. Since concepts can only be differentiated by appealing to a concept that transcends the class, the concept of the concept can only be differentiated by appealing to a concept outside the class of all concepts. Since the concept cannot be the principle of particularity, in virtue of which each concept is a distinct concept, and all concepts fall within the class of concepts, there is no concept to which one could appeal to differentiate the class of concepts. Thus, the class of concepts would be completely undifferentiated. This is what I call the problem of the missing difference. Since all concepts are in the domain of conceptuality, there is no concept outside the domain of concepts to which one could appeal to differentiate from these concepts. However, the proposition that there are no concepts seems to require a lot of concepts, being concept and matrix. So I think there are many. You could say that that was not terribly nice. Since one cannot divide the class by appealing to anything within the class itself, the only way to differentiate the class of concepts would be to appeal to something that transcends the domain of conceptuality as such. Since only the non conceptual lies beyond the domain of the concept, one can only appeal to some given non conceptual concept to differentiate a particular concept from other concepts. Thus, in order to differentiate concepts from one another, you must appeal to some non conceptual given. 
which is nature and experience. Hence the fact that the empiricism never goes away. This is what I call the problem of absolute empiricism. You could have also called it absolute naturalism or the problem of psychology. Why psychologism? Let us rehearse the course of reason. The PNC entails the principle of universal and particular concepts. Further, this entails that each concept is distinct in virtue of something non conceptual. However, this is a contradiction. By dividing a class of concepts with something non conceptual, it is in virtue of something non conceptual that various concepts are conceptually distinct from each other. Since it is the principle of non contradiction which engenders this division of concepts in the first place, and this leads us to contradiction. The principle of non contradiction itself leads us into contradiction. Since contradictions cannot be true, the PNC is not even true on its own terms. Ironically, the PNC itself gives us evidence for its own falsehood. As Hegel will tell us, contradiction is the rule of truth, not consistency. Formal thinking thrusts us into the non conceptual. For this reason, it's not a surprise that formal thinking inevitably drives us into mysticism. Formal logicians and mystics may seem to be strange bedfellows, but they're actually two sides of the same. Every time I bring up mysticism, when I talk to analytic philosophy, they get upset. I, I, I actually want to tell them. Like my life is absolutely amazing. It does fun too. All right, the problem of nihilism. We are, we are going to get to it. The problem of the missing difference leads to absolutely nihilistic consequences when the conceptual structure of the concept is mapped into existence. If what exists, if what exists transcends the concept, then the concept will remain incommensurable with existence and the concept will never be a problem. True. Since philosophy knows by means of the concept, if existence transcends the concept, philosophy can know what exists. In order for philosophy to know what exists, existence itself must always already be formed. Now, since the absolute exists and it must be conceptually formed, nothing can exist unless it instantiates some kind of truth. Indeed, one cannot refute this proposition with a counterexample. For any counterexample would instantiate the concept. If I refer to a counterexample, I refer to something that is, and thereby instantiates a concept, such as the concept of truth. Since the absolute exists, it too must have a truth. To match one's concept with the absolute presupposes truth in the absolute itself, that the absolute is constituted by a unity of concept. Given that every being instantiates a concept, the limits of the concept are the limits of existence. However, if the absolute really is conceptual in form, and concepts are conceived according to the division of principles, a significant ontological problem arises. And I think this is a problem of fish to shelling and I think there's also citations for this. The concept is a principle of unity. As such, it can account for what all beings have in common. However, it is not a principle of difference. Since the principle of difference must transcend the concept, and the concept is instantiated in all beings, the principle of difference must transcend everything that exists all beings. However, because there is nothing beyond the genus of being, the virtue of which beings can be differentiated, no beings can be differentiated, and no beings can exist. In order to better see the problem, just consider it from the side of being. The concept of being, of, among many others, is all encompassing, it applies to everything. As such, it is an absolute concept that applies to nothing. Every being instantiates the absolute of being. But because there cannot be any correspondence to the concept of being with the being, unless the being instantiates the concept, the concept of being is omnipresent in being. And since the concept of being is present in all beings, and the principle in virtue of which something is particularized must transcend the concept of being, it follows the principle of particularization is transcending the beings. Shelley gives the same argument. Since the principle of particularization must transcend all beings, there is no being at all that can account for the particularity. Since only nothing is beyond being, it seems that the principle of difference could only come from nothing. But nothing exists in nothing. Thus, if the difference could only have its origin in non-being, no differences <coughs> negating and negating there could be. Since difference or otherness and negation are all conditions for finitude, if there were no differences, no finite beings would be. Hence, being cannot be particularized and cannot be particularized. And this is what I call the problem of nihilism in, in using Yakuza's charge. It is an ontological extension of the problem of nihilism. Shelley himself draws this inference in his identity. In the presentation of my system, he claims that nothing can be said to be silent. 
And then the corollary proclaims that from the standpoint of reason, it's infinity. Fichte considers this problem the Hauptfrage of his Wissenschaftsfrage, at least in the letter to Reinhardt, 1795. Although Schelling proclaims the problem to be inevitable and without a solution, Hegel claims to solve the riddle. Hegel raises the problem both in the science of logic and in phenomenology. I'll just quote the science of logic. The essence of philosophy has often been located by those already adept in the things of thought, that's sufficiently shown, in the task of answering the, the question, how does the infinite go forth from itself and come to finitude? We could also ask, how does the absolute come to infinity? This, as opinion would have it, escapes conceptual comprehension. In the course of this exposition, the infinite, as whose concept we have arrived, will further determine itself and the desideratum, how the infinite, if one can so express oneself comes to finitude, will, uh, will be manifested in the, in the full manifold. To summarize, on the traditional view of concepts, neither any concept nor any being should exist. Nothing should be, no beings, no thoughts, no concepts, everything is not. But everything is not known. Here we are. Either we abandon the view that what exists is structured conceptually and endorse a form of mysticism. There's also a reason that always works. There's also good reason for not just if people are foolish, uneducated. Or we can rethink the character of the concept. Hegel's science of logic pursues the option. Hegel evades the nihilistic consequence of traditional rational philosophy by imbuing the concept of power and self particularization, such that the concept can be responsible for its own existence. In philosophy, everything is at stake, and we philosophize out of an emergency, not only for the sake of our own existence, but for the sake of all things. Finally, on to Hegel. Hegel's phenomenology of spirit shows that any attempt to relativize conceptual knowing only absolutizes it again. By limiting conceptual knowing to consciousness and opposing it to an object that transcends it, the object is not conceptual. However, the claim that the object is not conceptual is the conceptualization of the object. The knowing subject learns that the concept is all it has, takes a few little things. It is instantiated in the subject and the object in the and given that the concept is both subject and object, the concept corresponds with the object, for it is the object of the universe. The concept is true, for it is true to itself. However, with the absolutization of the concept, the conceptual distinction between the subject and the object collapses. The science of logic begins without presupposition. It begins without any determination posited in advance, but only because phenomenology has destroyed through the self-destruction of all presupposition and knowledge. In my own argument against the PNC, I try to give at least a quick case for the self-destruction of the object. Hegel's logic begins with the total elimination of all conceptual distinction. With the collapsing of the difference of subject and object, the logic begins with the concept of pure indistinction, the concept of that which is without distinction, Zion, Zion of mind. Although the logic does not begin with the logic of the concept, the logic is the, dom is the domain of absolute conceptuality, a domain that is constituted by the beings that are absolute concepts. Through the self-development of the concept, the concept determines itself to be conceptual. I won't reiterate that because that's not science. What remains for us is to only consider what absolute conceptuality is. The absolute is unconditioned. It is not conditioned by anything that lies beyond. Even that the absolute is universal and unconditioned, there is no being outside of it by which it can be determined. Because the concept is absolute, there is no co concept beyond the concept by which the concept might be determined. As absolute, it must relate to itself, but there is nothing else to which it could relate. Since it is an absolute concept, if it did not apply to itself, it would not be absolute. Thus, absolute concepts must be self consequential and it is exactly because it is absolute that it must apply to itself. Simply put, any question concerning the absolute requires a self predicate to answer, exactly because it is absolute. Hegel's doctrine of the concept answers the question, what is a concept? When we ask, what is a concept? We must answer that the concept is such and such. To say in a subject that it is such and such is to attribute a concept of universal to the subject. For this question, for this reason, the question, what is the concept, asks, what is conceptual about the concept? What is conceptual about the concept applies the concept to itself. It's an act of self referential Instead of applying the concept to a particular concept, number of quality, the question calls us to apply the term to itself. Accordingly, the question, what is the concept, requires self-referential answer. 
Hegel's logic reiterates time and time again, being itself becomes finitude itself, as singularity itself as singularity. In his remarks on being, nothing, becoming, Hegel will even make self-reference condition for conceptuality itself in his derogatory remarks about the concept of being. So it, it's a false concept. One might suppose that the question, what is the concept? Oh, we've gone directly, done something wrong. <laughs> oh, we're okay, good. That is answering. Okay. One might suppose that the question, what is the concept, is peculiar insofar as it requires a self answer, but in fact it shares a common feature with other related questions concerning the absolute, such as what is being. When we answer the question, what is being, we must answer that being is such and such. The answer predicates the concept of being to itself. When one specifies what it is to be, or specifies what it is for being to be, one has applied the concept of being itself. What is the being of being? The self-referring reflexivity of the question demands the self-referring because the question, what is the concept, applies the concept to itself, the concept itself must also have some universal conceptual content. Insofar as the concept has some conceptual content, that conceptual content will constitute the predicate for the judgment the concept is conceptual. Just as the judgment of quality is conceptual, places quality in the class of concepts, so does the judgment of concept is conceptual, place the concept in the class of concepts. Thus, the concept is not only the universal concept at all, common, but is also a particular concept, or an instance of the concept. The concept is its own particular. In some, the self-referential aspect of the question, what is the concept, implies that the concept is existentially applicable. In order to answer the question, what is the concept, not only must the concept apply to itself, but it must also be sufficient for the creation of a particular instance of that self, namely itself. The concept is both the universal that concepts have in common, and it is a particular concept within the class of concepts. And of course, you, you, you see that in the logic that there are many concepts, and the concept is one of them. If you want to be one of them. So, kind of obvious in this group. Nevertheless, the concept is not only universal and particular, it's also singular. And there's the book. To particularize itself, the universal must negate itself as merely universal. And determine itself. This self negation is an act of self differentiation whereby the universal differentiates itself from its universality. By differentiating itself, it determines itself to no longer be the universal, but universal and particular. However, insofar as the universal is distinct from the particular and the particular from the universal, the universal is one of two determinations. As such, the universal and particular are each distinct contents, each of which is one in number this and that. Because both universal and particular are instances of the universal, the universal itself is a it is particular. However, insofar as the universal and particular are both particulars, it follows that the particular itself must be this. For the universal and the particular have particularity. Thus, the universal is particular and the particular is universal. By particularizing itself, the universal is not just universal, but as universal, it is the unity universal. Likewise, the particular is not just particular, but while particular it is universal. Since universal and particular only signify one side of this unity, Hegel introduces a new term to signify this identity of the universal, particular or singular, which connotes the unity of the universal. The concept is not just universal and particular, it's also singular. Because the universal and the particular are both the unity of the universal and particular, both the universal and particular are singular. It is important to note that singularity is first and foremost a totality concept. Insofar as each concept, universal, particular, and singular, is the totality of concepts, each is the one only concept, the singular. The concept is alienated from itself in particularity and returns to itself in singularity. As a totality concept, singularity is not just the totality. Because singularity is distinct from the universal particular, it is a determinant. Singularity, the unity of universal in particular, is distinct from the concept of universal in particular alone. Singularity is a particular. It is this determinant one that is one in number and exists in distinction from others. However, because the universal in particular two are singularities, singularity is universal. Singularity is the whole concept, each instantiates singularity. Finally, as one of the three that constitutes the concept, it is not just a separate concept. 
but one of the determination of the it is not just a different concept, but a specific determination of the whole concept. Each concept, universal, particular, singular, is singular. Singularity is the whole and an element. Singularity is the totality and an element. All right, that's the worst exegesis, but I have to do some of this. Now I'll speak about rather than with me. The existentially implicative aspect of the concept of the concept is also evident in questions concerning being. Since the question what is being can only be answered in a self predicate way, by predicating being to being, being falls into the class of genus beings. Because being belongs within the class of being, being would no longer merely be the class of being, but would be a particular being in Being makes itself be. The onto theology is not really such a bad thing. Simply put, any inquiry into the absolute will discover that its concepts cannot be without self predicate. Following the self predicative and existentially implicative dimension of the question, what is the concept? We immediately discover that the question, what is the concept, requires that the only legitimate answer to the question must establish an internal principle of truth. Because the universal must be particular in virtue of itself, the correspondence of this particular, namely the particular concept in itself, can be established by consulting the concept of the universal alone. Thus, the legitimate answer to the question what is the concept demands that the answer construe the concept as that which is true in virtue of itself. Cap auto, auto from auto, one of the answers itself lies. Legal is the itself by itself, now the path. The truth of the concept or the existence of the concept in extension of form can be achieved by means of the concept alone without having to refer to. Since absolute truth not only engenders correspondence with the concept of its instantiation, but also requires that truth be conditioned. A concept would be absolutely true if it were not true in virtue of another, but true in virtue of itself. And since the concept is, is existentially and implicative, it implies its own existence, it follows that the concept is true in virtue of itself and is thereby absolutely true. The concept of the concept that is self predicative and existentially implicative ought to be absolutely true, true in virtue of since the concept as such must be self predicated existentially, true in virtue of itself, the concept is no longer final. It no longer depends upon another principle of truth that would lie outside of it, such as an intuition of the concept. For this reason, the truth of the concept is free of all conceptual givens. It is foundation free, in that sense, free of any appeal to a non conceptual given. That's what I mean by foundation. The logic in general is also foundation free. So we know. What is more, the concept would no longer be a mere possibility, but insofar as it is possible, it would necessarily be actual. The concept is not only a principle of possibility, but it's self realized. As Hegel explicitly states, the science of logic advances an ontological, ontological to the objective existence of the concept, which I know is finishing objectivity. Because the universal is self predicated and existentially implicated, it must also be contradictory. Since self particularization is an inherently contradictory concept, that's objective why we rejected it in the traditional notion. And the concept is self particularizing, the concept is inherently contradictory. Since the universal is particular in virtue of being universal, its particularity consists in its universal. That in virtue of which each particular is particular is indistinct from that in virtue of which each universal is constant. However, a particular qua particular is the instance of the universal is not itself a universal. So, since it's a contradiction for the universal to be particular in virtue of its very universality, the concept of the concept implies a contradiction. Because the concept of the concept is contradictory, Hegel even claims that every instance of the concept, every particular concept, must be contradictory. Hegel's Lehre von der Brücke presents the concept, so here's my summary, as self predicative, existentially implicative, or self particular, true in virtue of itself, and absolutely true, simultaneously synthetic as well as analytic in opposition. Infinite, not limited by an external and contradictory. Given that truly conceiving the absolute is only possible by integrating self predication and existentially implicative structure into conceptual determinacy, any concept of the concept that denies these features cannot succeed in truly conceiving. 
For Hegel, the concept is itself the absolute. It is true in virtue of it. Since every concept instantiates the concept, every concept should instantiate the structure of it. Consider the concept of being. Being, I'm going to go ahead and skip this. I've talked enough about it. Being and all the other structures. If you don't, you know, we don't think we have a lot of work each one. Some are harder than others. Quantity is something important. Hegel's construal of the concept as self particularity instantiates the very general feature of the self the self the self relativizing of the absolute. As self particularizing, the concept relativizes itself, for it determines itself to be one differentiation of the concept. As a differentiation of the concept and as particular, the absolute concept exists in relative order. It is one difference and excludes other differences, thereby standing in relation. The language of ontology theology, universal being, stands in one determination of being. But again, that's a result that, that, that should be the case. It's not inherently a problem. It's something that, that just can't be. But that's exactly what we must be. Ontology theology must be. It's getting trouble. Is this being recorded? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm on record. I said that. Okay. But it may be not the end of the story. Because this all the Heideggerism, because this difference is also the concept of such, the particular is also not just one of others, but it is the absolute in virtue of which it is. With is the singular. Hegel's dialectic definition of the concept equally relativizes the absolute. absolute. Qua absolute, the absolute is universal. The qua relative is particular. Qua absolute and relative are the same. The absolute is absolutely absolute, the one and all. Only when it itself is relative, only when it achieves singularity, can it isolate. The absolute is the one and only, the singular one. Because Hegel's concept is such that the universal is that which determines and particularizes itself, it is existentially implicative and thereby relativized. The absolute can only be absolute if it negates itself as absolute and determines itself. It could exist outside itself, some kind of impulsive. In this way, Hegel can account for the fact that the concept determines itself to be non conceptual. And even the non conceptual itself is integrated into the self determination. <coughs> the absolute can only exist if it is eliminated from its own conceptual being. Being is that which effaces itself with the finitude of things and perpetuates its existence as the self. Despite this necessary moment of self loss, in the concept, Hegel is unequivocal that the concept, which is the absolute, does not completely lose itself in its function, but continues to preserve itself in its otherness. Because the concept preserves its absolute being even in its self organization, the relativizing of the absolute does not undermine its absolute being. Even in its non conceptuality, it is absolutely non conceptual. The concept is the absolute, and it is in a constant state of self. But as self negation, it's always a self that preserves itself. It preserves itself in each act of self negation, such that the concept of the totality preserves itself in the disturbed. Indeed, the term can always upon is another formulation of the absolute self contradiction. It is the absolute that is outside itself. The absolute does not cease to be itself, even as far as it exists outside of itself. In some, for Hegel, it is through this process of self negation. The concept renders itself a totality in which each determination of the concept is an element of itself. And I'll also note that that actually that idea that the concept is an element of itself isn't the famous shell of itself. Although on its fact, on its face, the concept of self externalization may appear fanciful or ad hoc, the concept of self externalization is endemic to and necessary for the existence of ordinary so called abstract universes. Indeed, Hegel's doctrine of the concept can account for the apparently paradoxical nature of universes. The paradox in the book I call the problem of instantiation. I think this is one of the more interesting. Although on its uh, the, yeah, this the structure fully visible in the more mundane structure of the concept, the universal as multiply realizable can repeat itself in a number of different independent ways. Each particular is a different, is is different. And the same universal exists in each one. Accordingly, the self same universal, which is one in one, is fully instantiated in many mutually exclusive particular. 
As a result, the same universal, which is one in number, must be as many in number as the particulars in which it is instantiated. The universal is other than this. Each particular instantiates the very same universal, or as quite a whole universal, yet each particular excludes the others. Although the universal is different from itself in each case, it preserves itself as the self same universal. In his, this is just the argument that goes on in Parmenides, but now it's just the truth, not the problem. Plato recognizes that in order for forms to be imminent in their particulars, they must be in contradiction with themselves. It is for this reason Plato rejects the view that forms are imminent in the particulars, or something in them. Hegel, to the contrary, can explain why multiple instantiation is inevitably contradictory. The universal particularizes itself. Each is the same universal, although it is not the same. Hegel's absolute dialectism affirms that the concept is absolute. Because it is absolute, the concept must be responsible for its own existence. Via its power of self referential predication and existential implication, the self particularizing concept realizes itself without the assistance of any non conceptual formation. And as absolute, the concept is completely self determining and without presupposition. Not only is the concept responsible for its own existence, but then the claim here is more extreme that nothing else can exist except the concept and what it determines itself to be. Because the concept is absolute, nothing can exist independently of it. As Hulgate notes, nothing, not even nature itself, is outside thought as such, and it is only via thought that our awareness of it is possible. Still, this way of articulating the absolute is not strong enough. If something other than the apt concept existed for which the concept were not responsible, then the concept would be other than this one. And as such, the concept would only be one of the duality principles. Even if the concept applied to the other principle, it would not be responsible for the existence of that other principle, and would thereby be limited to it. In order to be absolute, nothing can exist except the concept and what it determines to be. Hegel does not hide the fact that the self particularizing concept is God's. Were the existence of the concept indebted to a principle other than the concept, the concept would not be true in virtue of itself. Rather, it would be true in virtue of something else and would thereby fail to be absolute in that itself. In addition, by introducing a second principle, or like many things, responsible for the existence of the concept, the concept would exist in virtue of something else. It would not even be the concept, but the concept is something which exists in virtue of itself. That's what it is. Indeed, by refusing to acknowledge that the concept is sufficient for its own existence, one would reintroduce an absolute division and dualism between form and content. The concept is responsible for the being of all beings, whether they be logical, natural, or spiritual. As Hegel himself proclaims, only the absolute idea, the true concept that conceives itself as true being. The absolute idea is the truth of the concept that conceives itself to be true. As Hegel makes evident, there is no other being than the absolute idea itself. Just as the absolute idea alone has being, the concept alone is sufficient for truth itself. Truth has only the concept, he says, as the element of its existence. That's from him. Only the concept as the element of its existence. Yeah, both on the, on the nature of the In this logic, Hegel claims that the concept is responsible for its own logical being. In the philosophy of nature, philosophy of mind, and philosophy of history, Hegel goes further to insist that the concept is a creative power responsible for other dimensions of the absolute, not producing its logic, but its nature of the history. The presence of the self-realizing and autonomous reason in Hegel's own words is present throughout his entire nature of the I haven't put up the words because you guys know that. According to Hegel, reason is the material for its own realization. But I have the book, so I have to what that is. Having acknowledged the central role of the ontological argument in this thought, we learn that nothing else is revealed except the true concept. Accordingly, because the idea is revealed, Hegel must be a metaphysical monist. If by this term we mean that what exists is the singular agency of the concept. Because the singular agency of the concept must be without presupposition, the concept in its logical being is true in itself. Because the concept gives itself existence, Hegel identifies the development from concept to truth and objectivity, the process by which the concept determines itself to be objective, or by true, as a revised version of the ontological wherein the concept of God is sufficient to justify the existence of God. In Hegel's case, it is the divine concept that gives itself existence. Like Spinoza before him, Hegel endorses the version of the truth in the concept. 
We're almost done. We'll never be so he endorses a version of the proof of concept. However, unlike Spinoza, it is proof does not proceed by axioms or definition. In fact, it is not a proof at all, for it is an ex expression of the absolute self change concept, a process that begins with any person. If one can learn whether a thing is or anything, There are no external examples. Hegel's dialectical transformation of the ontological argument is a good example of Hegel's attempt to transform Spinoza's substance into an absolute situation. There is one being, a self particularizing concept, a being that is free because it is absolutely self determined. Substance must become subject. Hegel claims the concept to be true in virtue of itself. It is an ontological argument such that the concept exists in virtue of itself alone. The concept gives rise not only to the concept of speed, but to space, not just the determination of nature, but to nature, not just the determination of speed, but to spirit. It must be nature and spirit themselves. Otherwise, an untenable dualism of father world and answer would further reinstate the question of nature. The profundity of Hegel's solution can be better appreciated if we compare the relation of law to the world. It is law to the classical Maybe classical classical. In Catholic theology, in Catholic theology, one version of Catholic theology, God is being, it's very dangerous, and God creates the world. God transcends the world as his cause and is omnipresent and all the That God is being and is perfect means that God has nothing. However, if the world has being and God stands apart from it, God would be limited by the world. God would lack something. And this is, of course, why it's very important in the reading theology that you know the world nothing. In this way, God has to infinity. But that seems problematic for Hegel. By imbuing a concept with the power of self determination, for Hegel, God is no longer burdened by madness, which limits and undermines his perfection. God particularizes himself into logic and nature. Via our religion, God he knows itself as a self particularizing God. When the absolute substance becomes the subject, God is no longer limited by. Thereby fully enjoying realizing his infinite, his infinity perfection. Conclusion coming to the end. The summary of the book <laughs> without quotation or secondary literature references. We can talk about it as much as we want. The 20th century is arguably a century dominated by the black infinite, and thereby a century dominated by relativity. Whether that's formalism. The early 21st century, too, looks to be a century dominated by the dominant The dominant trends in both the analytic and continental traditions in the 20th century deny the truth of the affirmative, the true absolute. They seem to share an assumption in common. And here I overgeneralize for the sake of rhetorical point. The universal is not self particularizing. In its early manifestation, this shared assumption leads them to critique absolute fact. Just as for Heidegger, we have the ontological difference being is not being. Or Russell advances his vicious circularity principle for which whatever involves one act, whatever involves all the action, must not be one of the action. In each case, the universal is never a principle of its own particularization and is relativized beyond redemption. In each case, we discover a concept impotent to realize itself and thereby inherently formal. As I hope to show, this classical assumption concerning universality that underlies these traditions destroys itself. Self destructive, epistemically, and ultimately nihilistic. Through the self consciousness of the limits of formal reason, time and again, good continental philosophers from Heidegger to Sartre to Levin, Nasser, Derrida, etc., point us to the incompleteness of conceptual knowledge. We never think it all, it's always something missing. The formal thinking, so characteristic of analytic philosophy, in fact, thrusts us into paradox and into the transcendental. Sometimes this intimate connection of formal thinking with mysticism is recognized, such as in Wittgenstein's tragedies. Through the failure to conceptualize the absolute, the philosopher experiences the absence of the absolute. However, what has disappeared, as I've argued, is not the absolute. What has disappeared is a one sided absolute, an infinitude that excludes its own finitude. In that very experience of the disappearance of the false infinite, the true infinite appears before us. In the failure to conceptualize the absolute, we experience opposing and mutually exclusive categories, falling into 
the absolute qualities of the relative, the absolute being cannot be differentiated between the two. And thereby we do in fact conceive of the absolute as a true contradiction. The experience of the absolute is an experience of the absolute that no longer excludes its non-being, but is constituted by its relativity. The absolute is absolute just insofar as it is not absolute. And only then can it be absolutely absolute. The absolute exists and can be known because it is encountered in the absolute contradiction constituting the absolute. Through the self negation of formalism, postmodernism, new realism, the true absolute reveals itself. But it does not just cancel these traditions, but preserves them within itself as moments by which it ends, as moments by which it realizes itself. New realism and postmodernism are the equivalents of tradition and self negation. Just like the tradition in general. In short, this self destruction of formal thinking need not be realistic, but could very well be the prelude to a philosophy of the absolute. An absolute philosophy that transcends the limits of continental and analytic philosophy. The enemies of the absolute are everywhere, but we are called to love them. For they too are manifestations of the divine glory and power of absolute truth. To embrace them within the love of the world does not mean to totally succumb to them, but to cancel and preserve them, out of them, within the absolute itself. By drawing these traditions into contradiction, we draw them closer to ourselves, closer to the absolute, to a post critical absolute metaphysics. By drawing them into the absolute, we draw them closer to participating. In the absolute apperception of the living God, thereby enabling them to work as well as the vessels by which the absolute and the living God knows itself. A little long, my apologies. Thank you, Gregory, for an exciting, inspiring, and very, very rich. Uh, talk. I would suggest we have a brief discussion. I'm sure that many topics that recurred in Gregory's talk will also come back uh, at the second panel. So I would say 10 minutes for a discussion and I'll open the floor for questions. And then we'll go to the commentaries. After then we have a break and oh. then we have the two commentaries and then, uh, it's okay. and then uh, yeah. a, an open discussion. Yeah. 
That's all. Yeah. I think I understand. Yeah. yeah, thanks so much. Thank you for your question. Um, so I think it's also true in behavior. Yeah, so that was the first way you asked that. So I don't think it's also true in behavior. And you're right, there are many things that have to be attributed to the behavior. But I wonder whether we couldn't find Um, oh yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. That so I saw somehow I, I got quiet. Okay. Um uh so I, I think you can find cases where uh, you have something like that's absolute where you have to go in both logic and technology, but I like what you said. So this is not the uh, the the counter to your view. When we talk about the absolute idea, because it's an adjective, and as you said here, we're describing a process, right? Process of knowing itself, but I would say that the process itself is absolute. So when we talk about something being absolutely absolute, this is really a kind of self description or a kind of the adjective is applied to itself. So when you have this self referential predication, I don't think it's um, as so easy to draw a, a, a clean distinction between the adjective and the content of the adjective, because then these would be distinct and other. But in fact, what you have is something like um, an adjective that describes itself. Maybe I put that off. So I think it is the process that um, we don't have to think of the process as a as a thing in some way that proves to itself. But I definitely would resist only thinking of the absolute when we think of the magic level. I would include that, but I would say, yeah, this self-referential character is such transforms our thinking so, uh, so I, I hope that makes sense. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Could we ask you then? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. This was very insightful and helpful, Adam. I'd like to kind of, I mean, I really, I'm really sympathetic to the notion of the absolute by uh, I'd like to better understand it by um, offering you a vocabulary, which you did not use, but yeah. it might be helpful. So, um, and also understand this often theological implications of this by which starts with the premise, the premise is being is to be created. And what is that sort of being? And I like to offer two different <clears throat> notions here. You could differentiate between an absolute realism and an absolute actualism. And I'm kind of inclined to take the argument to show that it's an absolute realism. That's to say that we have an absolute that has an independent being, so to speak, and this is that it does exist, and it does so through contradiction. And by applying negation and dialectic, you can get to know what there is, but that what there is as a self particularizing, self containing object is what there is. That's the realistic approach. Yeah. And I do must say that I find it um, somewhat uh, peculiar in Hegel that he has a different notion of the absolute, and that is what I would like to call actualism. Mm -hmm. That is to say, it's, he stresses the dependency of the absolute from the subject, but that's to say, the logic. Of knowledge of the one of getting to know the other, it's not a logical discovery, that is a realistic approach, but it's a not, not logical constitution. Yeah, so this field hides this, this big importance that is spread upon the logical revelation and reflection of, of this observation. Yeah. So it's a kind of a it is there, but it's only there because of us, so to speak. And that is a different logic than in, in this realism. Yeah. And I, I kind of kind that's of the absolute idea. Yeah. yeah, yes, thank you. So let's say I'm a bit skeptic. Okay, thanks so much. And and I'm actually I'm really glad that you raised this uh, because um, you'll notice in my own language, I um, and this is my fault. I will go back and forth from talking about applying a concept to itself, and then I put my own subjectivity in it. Mm -hmm. Versus, say, the concept conceptualizing itself, as though it could do it without me. And you see that, like, um, I think Hegel says something in the, the track on the reference, one of the introductions to science and logic. 
we don't control the concepts. We're not, you know, they somehow guide us, or they're the ones that are really in charge. And I take that really seriously. Uh, and if you take it really seriously, you could read it and say, well, the concept is conceiving itself, even if I never conceive. So that is definitely the position that I take about the logic, at least. The concept conceives itself, even if none of us ever conceived being, being would still be nothing, eternally and such, even if none of us ever knew. So that's a hyper, you could even think of it as maybe neoplatonic. I, I may be getting so much mad and wrong and stuff like that. It's fine. You, know, you love the truth and your friends. You're trying to get this. But, um, on the other hand, the full story required a reference to real subjects and real meaning temporal spatial agents, you and I. And then when, once we've gotten to art and religion and philosophy, of course, um, the act of philosophizing is removed. And thinking God's thoughts after him, to use Japanese language, uh, I can put all of that self predication. I, I can do it myself. What's interesting there is then that you have another sense of subject in the logic than you do, I think, with real subjects. I think subjectivity is the concept. The concept is the subject. It is the agency. That's what my talk is trying to say. The concept is the real agency, and we are agencies, but in virtue of its agency. So it is closer to an absolute realism, for sure, but I don't want to say that there's no real subjects it's just a question of what's the relation of the real subject to um, the logical subject. And how are we supposed to conceive of that relation? And that's difficult for all of us as readers or our thinker. Uh, we may not take this really hardcore metaphysical route that I'm taking, but I have a hard time not doing that. If I'm doing that. But yeah, so that's very helpful. Those need to be distinguished and they're related. It. And my worry about any kind of absolute actualism that doesn't have this. Um, I worry about, well, I, I have other worries about it. I hope that makes sense. So we are almost done with the time. There was one more question. If it is related to the topics close to the books, I would suggest we take it to the other discussion. If it was closely related to the talk and you think you can do it in a few minutes, you can do it. I can answer in one minute. <laughs> Okay, yeah, yeah. One, no. one question that's one, that you yeah. have to choose. You have to particularize the question. Um, thank you for your talk. Just, I was just thinking now on your side, do you have it to say something that the concept can be said without us or subject or present subject ever like being or thinking of the concept? Does this not imply some kind of dualism to make them? And. <laughs> Yeah, I have your critique. I have your critique in my <laughs> book review. Written down. So I definitely want to say something about that because it's a very good uh, point. And actually, I think that there is a problem in Hegel's own in Hegel's own thinking, and that dualism comes back up. So I think it's like uh, look at all the possible options. Uh, I I think this is the one that's best, but it still leaves you with. A, so first, there's the dualism of Empirical concept, this is how you did it in the review. The, the dualism yeah. of the empirical concepts and then the these like logical absolute ones, where like the empirical ones aren't um, self particularizing, right? So uh, at least some of them, and then um, the absolute ones are. And then we have this problem how do we go from one to the other? And then you can even push that back and then ask how do you go from the absolute self particularizing concept just to nature and just push it back and ask, uh, ask about that. Um, the easy answer, and it's, it's relatively cheap, so I'll give the cheap answer now, and after the comments, I'll add the more involved answer that brings the technical lit, which is that the empirical determinations are the self-externality, self-alienation of the absolute. So we have self-particularization, self negates itself, and the form of its self-negation are concepts that are not self -particular. So I tend to view the, the form and structure of non-self-particularizing non concepts as forms of the self alienation of the self particular But there's still a problem, there's still a, a problem of dualism lingering, which I'll come back to. 
that's that that's my cheap answer. That's the answer that's in the book, but it's it's not complete. And uh, we'll come back to that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Gregory. Again, thank, thank you. you. By Marco Bonito, who is a PhD student at the University of Padua, um, working on Whitehead's metaphysics and Hegel's metaphysics. Would that be a yeah. description of your project? Uh, please, Marco, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for your talk, which I really enjoyed. I will be not so brief, like 20 minutes, uh, 10 for the to sum up the contents of the books of the book and uh, ten for the possible critiques. Okay. Hegel's foundation of primitive physics, the logic of singularity, investigates the status of the concept in the Gillian thought, attempting a metaphysical interpretation of it. The text stands out for its rigorous argumentation and its strong theoretical orientation, clearly intended to emphasize the fundamental significance of the Gillian thought in the ongoing contemporary philosophical discourse. Although the extensive volume does not allow to treat it in its uh, entirety, an attempt is made here to offer, I bet briefly, a concise exposition of it, with the aim of highlighting its most interesting aspect and noting, finally, the possible critical ones. So uh, the first chapters of the book are devoted to a historical critical evaluation of a fundamental trend in the Western metaphysical tradition. It is through authors such as Plato, Aristotle, and finally Kant that most arise with the consideration of the history of thought as often leading towards the assumption of multiple principles at the foundation of knowledge. And this inclination is particularly evident in the form of dualism, of which in the Kantian opposition between intellect and sensibility, the categorical universal and the particular of intuition, one would rightly have the most eloquent exemplification. The adoption of such a stand surely permits the postulation of an ontological variety by which I think a philosophical justification of the heterogeneity of empirical experience appears to be possible. However, it is equally true that uh, it results in being as exposed to the criticism, the criticism of unjustified presupposition as it is incapable of giving reason for what must, uh, following Hegel, indicates by the name of singularity, namely the unity, the theoretical center around which the old world revolves, of particularity and universality. Thus, uh, the author's intention turns to those who attempted to cleanse the Kantian system of its fundamental flow by engaging in the search for the synthetic universal, uh, namely the absolute, in which all heteronomies could locate their genesis. In particular, the philosophies of Fichte and Schelling share the goal of overcoming Kant's duality principle, now resorting to intellectual intuition for the transcendental analysis of the eye, uh, now employing it in order to ensure the identity of subjective and objective. But uh, in each case, uh, rehabilitating a certain form of self preferentiality such that the absolute, the principle, knows itself, positing itself as the object or itself as such. For the author, this unitary form of identity and difference corresponds to the ontological and epistemological foundation of the only possible metaphysics. He identifies it, uh, its origin in the new Platonic tradition, as we call it in Platonic, but according to most of this tradition, finally find its most accomplished expression in Hegel's thought, more so than in Fichte or Schelling. When read from a Neoplatonic perspective, the Hegelian system indeed possesses the quality necessary for a correct understanding of the absolute, or similarly to say of the one. What distinguishes it is the conscious adoption of the trait of thought that the Western tradition has often, to varying degrees, rejected. The self-reference of the principle, which was already anticipated by the other proponents of the Hegelian movement, and possibly the violation of the axiom of contradiction. In general, the thesis underlying the historical philosophical reconstruction of the book's first part is that dualist philosophers like Kant have always precluded themselves from an authentic understanding of the absolute. And this is due to the strenuous allegiance to Aristotle's principium permissive. Moreover, the very division of principles is a result of a dogmatic acceptance of the non-contradiction law as the impossibility of self-reference, as we will say, and therefore the a purely unity of subjectivity and objectivity depend on it. What then needs to be noted, according to Moss, is how detrimental the consequences are for a philosophy that does not take the form of speculative monism. From the, from the rejection of the absolute does not in fact follow solely the impossibility of a correct determination of the finite, that's part of it, but above all the emergence of unresolvable apparatus, the clash with uh, ultimately resulting in defeat unless willing to renounce the assumption that it originates from. Thus, 
if it is true that recognizing the value of the data metaphysics allows one to approximate as closely as possible to authentic nature of the absolute, it is also true that rejecting the principles of Hegelianism entirely means inevitably a folding in contradiction and being exposed to the dangers of the six paradoxes, which are the primary focus of the first part of the text. And these are in order quite briefly. The problem of nihilism. As Moss shows uh, following Schelling, since there, are, since there is only one truth, there has to be only one principle. And to deny this means to be unable to provide any guarantee of the validity of distant and incompatible proposition as this will be derived from different assumptions. And in Shelley's case, the postulation of the principle of identity is aimed precisely at harmonizing separate horizons of spirit and nature. The problem of instantiation. Once the postulate of the duality of principle is accepted, one cannot provide a valid criterion for there to be correspondence between the two poles. In the case of Kant's critique, the, that the intellect cannot be intuit intuitive, in fact, prevents a real or normal understanding of ob objectivity. While in the case of the Platonic Parmenides, the impossibility for the universal to be wholly or partially in the particular, obliging their division, denies the formulation of judgment, so that a petite principle follows. The missing difference. From the juxtaposition of conceptuality and objectivity, it follows that the concept cannot exhibit existential implication, the particularization of the concept. But then there is no rationale for the difference between the class of concepts and particular concepts, neither internally nor externally. Not internally, because by assumption, the universality of the concept does not inherently contain the principle of its, own, of its own differentiation. Not externally, because there are no concepts external to the class of concepts. Nor can the diversity of concepts have a non conceptual origin. Otherwise, the, the class of concepts would not be such absolute empiricism. The opposite hypothesis that the conceptual concept is, in fact, solely empirical also leads to a contradiction. Specifically, it would require the identification of the universal of the concept and the sensory particular, contrary to our premises. And in alternative, if the existence of the former is entirely denied, the latter becomes unrepresentable and devoid of determination. The problem of ontotheology. If the opposition of object and concept grants the latter the status of universal, uh, then it also turns out contradictory to be particular. In fact, the concept's impossibility of internal differentiation presupposes that it assumes a determined form, uh, in unity or indivisibility, which, however, is opposed to other forms. In the Attic Aporias, such as the one with nothing, nothingness, find their origin in this paradox, that the universal as such is already determined and therefore particular, that being in order to be must set itself against nothingness, thereby entering into a relationship with something. When elevated to an absolute, the unconditioned universal cannot be confined within, let's say, an oppositional realm, nor thereby be subject to definition. And this is the problem to which negative theology seeks to provide a solution. The third man, since the absolute, in order to be referred to as absolute, requires a certain form of conceptualization and judgment, what follows can only be a regressus in infinity. If, as noted with the ontological problem, the absolute corresponds to, the, to an unrepresentable universal, then any attempt to conceptually describe it, being inherently particularizing, will prove insufficient. This inadequacy will eventually lead to the need to postulate a further absolute, which is not particular, and yet, paradoxically, particular because of that, not determined, and yet already determined, and so on, infinitum. According to the author's thesis, recognizing the contradictory nature of the principle turns out to be the only way to avoid these paradoxes that compromise the dualist metaphysics, as well as on a closer inspection the Eliatic monist that shares the same logic. It is not believe that, that, that the concept sorry, is thus a dialectic object, namely, namely determinable in a double-edged sense as a, at once particular and universal. And refusing to indulge in the possibility of, this, of an easy mysticism, he therefore opts for the Hegelian alternative, that of absolute dialectism, which is the subject of analysis in the second part of the book. Now, uh, Moss develops uh, his own theory of singularity by engaging with authors such as Alan Badiou, Robert Brandon, and Marcus Gabriel. Through these comparisons, the uniqueness of his thesis becomes evident. It is clear that the rejection of traditional logic allows for the construction of a framework based on fundamentally different assumptions. And these assumptions lead to a portrayal of the absolute with attributes tra traditionally considered to be mutually incompatible. Thus, the concept of the synthetic universal, whose necessity was indicated by both the second Fichte and Schelling, becomes a concrete possibility through the lens of Hegel. This concept entails the existential implication that the metaphysical tradition had 
previously deemed impossible, the possibility for the universal to generate the particular internal from itself. In the reconstruction offered by, offered by the author, chapter eight, the, the particularization of the universal, an expression of a reflexive, as we said, self-referential logical movement. What was previously implied as the problem of the third man, or also the ontological problem, now becomes an inherent quality of the concept itself. Its determination as an absolute whole corresponding to a conceptual predication is already a particular definition of it. Or in other words, a moment initially seen as analytic, where the universal register its identity with itself, through the act of positing a relation define its particularity, ultimately resulting in a synthetic process. From the definition of the self-identity of the concept, it follows at the same time that it's also different from itself. And this is so in as much as in the analytic proposition A is A, which is the self equality of the universal, the concept A is universal insofar as the, as the content of A is concerned, but particular concerning its form, for it appears that A is a such one in number, and therefore by definition particular. Again, in the propositional form, the universal includes a division such that posed as a predicate, it results in something determined. The definition of the concept changes its status, revealing a division between what it's posed, the finite form of the predicate, and what it's presupposed, its universality. Through the analysis of the concept, its contradictory nature thus emerges. Defined as universal, it is, for that very reason, particular. Particularity is inherent within universality as that which determines it. The, uni the unity of the universal and the particular is that the singularity, a concrete understanding of the absolute. Now, the fact that Moss identifies in the pages of the science of logic such a characterization of the concept is what highlights the uniqueness of this interpretation when compared to the dominant ones. Not only such an exegesis of the Galian idea clearly incompatible with the deflationist thesis of Hartman, of Hartman and the current thesis of Brandon or Christ, but also the gap between Moss, Moss's absolute dialectism and the other interpretation of Hegel's dialectic that nevertheless share the opposition to the principle of non-contradiction is quite significant. While traditionally the negation of the Aristotelian axiom has been recognized as unique to the finite and consequently to individual dialectical determinations, with the absolute viewed as a pacifying moment that reinstalls the unity of the whole, in, those, in the author interpretation, there seems to be rather a profound twist, such that the system can pursue a, real, a new arrangement of what he himself refers to as an inverted world using bigger, bigger terms. The individual dialectical moments are indeed abstract. But insofar as they do, they do not partake in the rational contradiction of the idea. The final determinations are indeed themselves contradictory. Nevertheless, because their intellectual understanding does not fully recognize the speculative contradictory nature of the absolute. And thus, the actual truth of the singularity is opposed to the merely apparent truth of finiteness. A beautiful sky is opposed to a reality, where only the former assumes the infinite form of the concrete universal, while the latter is still defective, insufficient. While Moss is certainly not the only one to interpret Hegel in this manner, and indeed the influence of the non-foundational non school where it comes from is evident, uh, the philosophical implication of such an hermeneutic deserves consideration. If I may offer a criticism, the main concern here is that an interpretation that posits, let's say, two different forms of contradiction, one false and the other true, runs the risk of reconstituting an apparatic form of dualism according to the Pax Desk. This is at least what seems to emerge from chapters 11 and 14, where it becomes clear that the distinction between the actual reality of the absolute and the realm of final determination also encompasses on the latter side the totality of empirical dimension. According to the reconstruction presented at this point, on the one hand, there is the self-referential truth of the concept, and on the other hand, the falsity of the heteroreferentiality of representational conceptuality, that such because it places its own particularity not within itself, but in the external realm of the scientific world. Now, while this interpretation may help avoid some of the, parox the paroxysm denounced by Kuhn, such as the possibility of deriving a pen from its mere concept, since such a concept would in fact be intrinsically false, it nevertheless raises potential doubts about the nature of the position between the concrete universal and the abstract domain of empirical representation. Is this a repetition of the ontological problem, insofar as the concept, even in the face of its speculative understanding, reveals an excess and otherness that denies its status as an absolute universality. Doesn't the presupposition of an heteronomy between finite and infinity correspond to the reaffirmation of an, unjust, an unjustified dualism, sorry, moving away from Hegelian principles 
upon closer examination, the fundamental problem of Ilias' reservity, that which opposes the whole, contradicts its essence, and does not share its status, it's still something that, by being placed beyond it, by the mere fact of being, prevents its actual existence, or the actual existence of the whole. Indeed, most actually gives the justification of the, uh, on the, posi of the position between empirical conception of particularity and complete universality. And it can be traced, for example, at the end of the aforementioned eighth chapter, where the author claims a partial departure from pre dialectics. Here, it is argued that for the contradictory nature of the absolute to be authentic, it must itself embody contradiction to the extent that the negation of contradiction ensures its consistency. And most states, and I quote, since consistency is also the negation of contradiction, one could properly consider consistency as the self-externality or self-alienation of the contradiction with itself. End of the quote. It will then be possible in this way to interpret the opposition of the finite as a confirmation of the contradictory nature of the absolute. Without such an autonomy, the absolute would cease to be itself. If the dimension of finiteness were denied, infinity would consequently vanish, as it would be deprived of the inherent contradiction that defines it. However, this proposed solution carries potentially uncontrollable consequences for the very understanding of the qualities of the absolute. In fact, it will soon turn out that the absolute is both universal and not universal, both particular and not particular. So that profound doubts will then arise regarding the actual status of the concept. The universality of the absolute would in fact be denied by a particularity that not, that's not internal to it, but external, thus implying that the concept is not the whole, but itself something fine. Facing two different kinds of particularity, one concrete implied by the self-identity of the universal, and one in the other abstract, presupposed for the self-externality of the contradiction, a third one would emerge. The universality of the singularity would in fact not be such, since its contradictory nature postulates the existence of uh, an outside world, uh, lacking its self referential structure. Second point of uh, exegetical nature is worth considering, and I'm way less sure about this one. <laughs> it is likely that the distinction between the representational and absolute conceptuality undermines and explains the very possibility of a correct understanding on Hegel's text, at least two factors. This is exemplified in the most interpretation by the doctrine of syllogism, as others pointed out. Uh, in uh, the context of the degrees law, uh, chapter 14. Consistent with the previously discussed reconstruction, the authors characterizes the syllogistics by attributing to it the fallacious status of the mere fine concept that's outside itself. And in other words, the syllogism is seen as an inadequate representation of the idea, inherently affected by a certain irredeemable abstraction. However, it is worth noting that uh, if this were the case, certain well-known Hegelian statements will remain unexplained. Uh, for instance, Hegel's assertion that the syllogism is the completely false concept, the rational. And in the same page, uh, he argues that uh, if the syllogism is rational, it's, it's also true that everything rational can be expressed through the syllogism. Um, and furthermore, Hegel's choice to conclude the entire system with the final formulation of the three syllogism in Syncopedia will become even more perplexing. It's a certainly a complex issue, since, for example, one could probably argue that the syllogistic structure at the end of the encyclopedia differs from the one presented in the logic. But nevertheless, it would serve, I think, as evidence of a potential problem inherent, inherent in such a reading of the system. This problem could be expressed as the obligatory negation of the so called transcategorical forms. And by this, I refer to the idea that the absolute can find an adequate characterization of itself within the contents developed by individual direct movement. And this is evident in categories such as the one of true infinity or contradiction itself, without which the portrayal of the idea as presented would not be feasible. In other words, opposing the concrete universal to the series of finite concepts could hinder its description, primarily because the identification of the synthetic nature of the analytic identity, the universal, can only occur through the adoption of certain forms of conceptuality, most notably contradiction, whose inadequacy, however, is here denounced. It will then follow that, again, a petit principi undermines that the, pos the possibility to talk about the absolute at all, since the contradiction, the, co the categories sorry, displayed for its portrayal prove themselves insufficient during the dialectical process. Eventually, there will be no absolute to talk about, because the impossibility of a positive description of it would imply the impossibility of any, any ontological claim. So, I mean, the question is about the distinction between true and false and the status of the 
final determinations. So in conclusion, it is worth noting that rising to concretity against the thesis proposed by the author does not diminish the value of the work, but on the contrary, underscores its significance. Despite the inherent complexity of the subject matter, which can naturally lead to, naturally lead to a potential misunderstandings, a fact that I would likely acknowledge, uh, Eckhart's foundation pre metaphysics uh, distinguishes itself through its clear exposition of human and rigorous writing. And these characteristics serve as an invitation for readers to engage with challenging texts of content and perhaps inspire them to undertake critical examinations. Now, this volume is not removed from the original Neoplatonic interpretation of the Galen philosophy, but also for the throughout exploration of its theoretical core. The ending issue of the principle here finds some new and simplest application, not merely a reflection on the unfair Hegel gate to it, but rather a genuine attempt to offer to Hegel the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Marco, for your rich comments. Now we we'll hear uh, a second response and comment from Michaela Bordillon, who's professor of philosophy at the Federal University of ABC in Salda Marte de Campo. And Michaela completed her PhD at the University of Padua on the notion of contradictory related logic, which was published in Society by Linguistica. And she's now working on a project on Hegel and such things. Okay. Thank you, Adela. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and have the chance again to discuss with you and with Marco and with all of you. Since the hard stuff, uh, hardcore stuff has already been presented by <laughs> Marco, I uh, feel free to just present a couple of general methodological considerations about the book, which are uh, in a certain way obvious, but uh, I think it's important to underline them. And then I will just come to a brief. Uh, Remarks, so, which is one of uh, uh, which is a problem that we have already discussed, and I would like to go on discussing with you. Um, I read the Greg's book during the pandemic. It was the perfect time to <laughs> So, and I have the title three or five hundred pages book, and um, from the methodological point of view, the interesting thing. Uh, is that uh, uh, when I started reading the book, actually I was like, uh, I was I entered in a state of desperation because I thought that Greg's was wrote like the book that I wanted to write about uh, Hegel and dialectism. I remember Luca when he told me he sent a message, but, so the book is published. <laughs> but, it <wasn't> true. <laughs> but it was not true because uh, my plan. The book that I still haven't published yet is <laughs> just about Hegel and dialectism, and your book is uh, much more than that. Um, and it is much more than that because it is a book on metaphysics, uh, meta on metaphysics, and uh, uh, it is a book on uh, about metaphysics that can be uh, read from various perspectives. Uh, it is a book, uh, first of all, on the notion of the absolute, uh, on the mobility and the existence of, and the existence of the absolute. Uh, um, but it's also a book about the problem of universality, the relation between universality and particularity, the problem of foundationalism, etc. Um, so you address uh, um, various kinds of metaphysical problems. Uh, with this general perspective of the problems of the absolute, and you do that uh, by referring to a lot of great name of Western uh, traditional uh, philosophy. Um, and my impression is that uh, in a certain way, um, your aim uh, is to place yourself at the center of the contemporary debate on metaphysics and philosophy of logic. Um, and you, the, the interesting thing is that you do that uh, strong interaction with the history of philosophy. Um, and here I come with these two general methodological uh, considerations. Uh, the first uh, is that, uh, uh, as I told you, the first time that we, that we discuss about your book, the interesting, the interesting thing about your book that is that you completely undermine the distinction between the history of philosophy and philosophy. Um, because on the one hand, uh, 
you show that uh, uh, your historical philosophical analysis is always moved by a strong theoretical uh, motivation that has as main core the notion of uh, the notion of the absolute uh, and on the basis of this strong theoretical motivation you go back uh, and uh, uh, calling your team uh, <laughs> uh, the great name uh, various great name of the uh, uh, history of western philosophy and uh, on the other hand your theoretical approach to the notion of the absolute uh, is constructed on a continuous critical dialogue with this uh, tradition. Um, so uh, the interesting thing is that uh, it's not just an interpretative book, it's not a commentary, but uh, you make explicit a series of uh, limits incorporated in a series of philosophical proposals to construct your own philosophical proposal about the absolute, the, the absolute actually. Uh, so it's not a book about Hegel, but it's a book where you call Hegel in your philosophical team to present your own philosophical proposal. And uh, the second uh, uh, important merit is that you also undermine another uh, classical distinction, which is the distinction between continental and analytic philosophy. Uh, uh, you have a lot of friends in your team with uh, this approach. There are a lot of people working on that, but I think that we still need to do a lot of uh, whiskey active work to do uh, in this respect. And uh, now while I was saying this, I, it comes to my mind and another thing that I was never, I, I don't even think I was mentioning. I think that in the contemporary debate, um, Maybe the new uh, distinction that we have to undermine is the distinction uh, between uh, the tradition, uh, Western traditional philosophy, and uh, other philosophical tradition that a lot of time does not do not seem to interact a lot. Uh, in my experience, since I worked in South America, um, this is a big problem. <laughs> um, and I say this because I give classes about Hegel uh, also with students and I uh, collaborate with uh, research that work with African philosophy, Brazilian philosophy, indigenous philosophy and it seems that we are working in completely different uh, fields mm -hmm. uh, so can I speak about the absolute with uh, is it a western Notion or is it really absolute as you pretend to argue? Uh, because uh, one of the main critics, one of the main like uh, mm, problem that I have uh, is that sometimes this kind of philosophical proposals, Hegel's one, but your proposal, which seems to be sometimes even more provocative than Hegel's one, seems to be incompatible with other kinds of philosophical sensibility. Because uh, but so if it is incompatible, this is a problem. Uh, because uh, you were trying to propose a, an absolute absolute. <laughs> but this absolute absolute is perceived at least and I say perceived because there are there, there is not a dialogue uh, or, or, and, a, and a systematic work on yeah. this dialogue yeah. it's perceived so, as a totalizing principle so. mm. but I know that you work I know that you work with Eastern philosophy yeah, too. Be great opportunity. the problem is um I've, I've been thinking about that during the last day the problem is how would this proposal be received in uh, uh, other uh, in other tradition at least uh, also different from the, the the western one and the eastern one i think about other uh, completely different philosophical uh, 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 approaches uh, tradition and if you think that it isn't compatible we need to work about this we need to think about this um so um, 
let's go on talking about uh, our problem let's now. Do it. Let's do it. <laughs> That's what I came for. Okay, uh, so uh, I just got a brief passage of your book 241. This was the passage that I quoted also in uh, one of our last conversation. Uh, given that the principle of non-contradiction is the ultimate source of the relativity of truth, the only way the absolute can be and can be known is by adopting absolute dialectism. Mm? So I underline the word, the word absolute here. Most simply, this means that the absolute can only be if it is contradictory. Uh, question are coming to my mind while I'm speaking. <laughs> okay, so absolute contradictory. If the absolute exists, it is a true contradiction. If there are no true contradictions, then the absolute cannot be. Likewise, if the absolute is known, that the, then there are true contradictions. Where there are there are no uh, where there are no true, true contradiction, then the absolute could not be known. End of quote. Uh, so. Uh, First question, is the absolute contradictory or self-contradictory? Uh, <laughs> because I was thinking about uh, a paper, which is one of the first paper I read about contra uh, contradiction in Hegel. And it is, um, the author is Franco Kiergin. Um, which was a professor here at the philosophy department. Now he lives in the middle of the mountains and he's studying Veda. And uh, he's 80 years, so he's a great guy. <laughs> what a wonderful life. <laughs> and playing piano. And, um, and Franco was, to, was trying to, sh to, to present a non-contradictory conception of contradiction. If I if, if I'm not wrong, the problem was that uh, the con the absolute can be contra con contain contradiction. Hegel says that the, in the doctrine of a of being that the absolute contain all negations, but it cannot be contradictory in itself. But the problem is how we think about uh, contradiction and self contradiction, the difference between these two notions. And then uh, another point, absolute dialectism. Mm -hmm. So your dialectism seems to be different from this one, of course. I hope so. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm a big, big fan. Now I'm trying to force uh, Graham uh, into... <laughs> if, you're up, if your dialectism is absolute, Graham dialectism is not absolute. Okay. But then the problem for me is to understand what absolute and not absolute or finite or limited dialectism can mean in our debate of the nature of contradiction. So how do you, what do you mean by absolute when you say absolute dialectism? Ah, and, um, and then I was going back thinking about uh, our problem, to what extent uh, Hegel's dialectism, or is Hegel's dialectism to some extent compatible with Graham's one? And my impression is that, uh, in a certain way, it is. It is compatible with Hegel's dialectism and Priest's dialectism are compatible on the perspective of the understanding, I think. And I was going back to this, this point when I was reading the lecture of the history of philosophy, where I think Hegel is doing a total mess when he's using the notion of truth and falsity, because he has exactly the same position that Priest has. He said that the, 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 the liar sentence is both true and false. But I would say that we yeah. could translate uh, the notion of true and falsity there with Christi, Kaitan, and Christi, because you're talking about a proposition. 
And we can say the same, uh, but then uh, you know, in other points, I think that Hegel is using the right notions. When he says, for he says, uh, Hegel says, for example, that uh, with being and nothing, that being and nothing are the same, and being and nothing are not the same. And he's a perfectly finite dialectist. <laughs> When uh, he says that the two propositions are both correct and not, co and not correct, but then uh, your uh, absolute dialectism, the kind of members, uh, our absolute dialectism, says that uh, if we follow Hegel, says that we need to understand these two propositions, uh, the truth of these two propositions. Uh, but the problem is that we need to, to, to conceive of the truth of, truth of these two propositions in the, both in their identity and in, in their difference. Um, so, given these considerations, I was picturing, <laughs> uh, I was trying to, 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 to think how can we conceive of the relation between truth and falsity. So what we are thinking about Richtigkeit and Unrichtigkeit, we don't have a lot of problems because the logical space of truth is still divided into spaces, truth and falsity, and Hegel, like Priest, can attribute a proposition to one of them or to them both, depending on the arguments we have for attributing a, a truth value. But we cannot think the logical space of truth, or for me it is difficult to conceive the logical space of truth and, as divided between truth and falsity <laughs> when we are thinking about Wahrheit and his relation to um, falsity. Um, we cannot even think of, of I think about a, a bi-dimensional space in that case. Hmm? Uh, because all, our conversation started from uh, your comment on my article where I was saying that everything in the logic is true, but then uh, you said, uh, how can you conceive truth without falsity? Mm -hmm. But then the problem is... <laughs> okay. But, but, but the problem is that with right, with truth and falsity, for me, it, it is... Uh, problematic to conceive the relation as a, 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 um, a relation of, a, of um, a binary relation uh, because there's something else going on there. And um, in that book panel uh, organized by, I don't remember the name, sorry, <laughs> in, uh, in, the, in the presentation of the 2021 presentation, we discussed about the notion of falsity, and if I am not wrong, you say that you were tending to conceive of falsity as the relation of non-correspondence to of a determination to its concept. Okay. Yeah, I've been thinking about you all the time. <laughs> uh, what a what a bad life in Brazil! <laughs> but the problem is that when when I have a determination and a, the contradictory character of this determination, and I mean fine, I'm not thinking about the absolute idea. I'm thinking of one of the determination or that we meet along the system. I'm not sure that uh, that contradictory the contradictory nature of that determination. Uh, can be conceived by saying that it is true and false, where falsity is a relation of non-correspondence to, to its concept. Because the contradiction there is expressing the fact that it is. The, the lack of determination is with respect to the absolute, not to its concept. And I stop this because I don't have an answer for all these questions. So I hope that you can help. Okay. Thank you, Michela, for your yeah. yeah. After watching a very rich comment, I see Greg as a exhausted the paper for <laughs> the point. I would say you have the floor for a, a possibly brief response to the 
as brief as possible. Very <laughs> brief. Yeah. Take the time. We have the room for uh, roughly 20 more minutes. And okay. Yeah. I won't take 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for the comments, the critiques. Thank you for such a thorough statement. You actually read what I wrote. <laughs> so, <laughs> Michaela, for continuing our conversation, and I'm glad we can actually continue to have this conversation since we share problems in common. It's important to be clear. We'll get clearer on how to respond. Yeah, so I want to begin maybe from the, the second set of comments to the first, because I think now my mind also needs to be somehow come back to the dualism uh, objection, which came up in the second twice, and then so on. So let me just say something general. This book. Uh, was written in the uh, in the style of um, what Hegel would say, someone who does their education for fun. So I think what Hegel accused Schelling of doing his education for profit, but of course that's uh, means that of course there will be uh, falses in it, and I think there are a number of them. So actually, I also took the opportunity to say where I think the book itself can be it's three years now since it's been published, and it has an otherness. Uh, and respect to me. So I'm very glad people liked it and it caused trouble, but it's causing, it also causes trouble for me. So, uh, and probably performing your education in public is something any young person has to do to get a job. So we're all in that, uh, that boat together. So, okay, so that's just one, one general comment. Uh, let me begin with the question about the, uh, what is the absolute diabetes? So the way that I try to uh, clarify this in the book is that it's the view that the world exists, but its existence uh, is a true contradiction. But I suppose there are others, and I think I use this term relative dialectism in the mm -hmm. book as one of the chapters to talk about people who, maybe this might be also misleading, who think there are true contradictions, but uh, the world's existence is not one of them. So like Marcus Gabriel, for example, uh, thinks arguably that there are true contradictions, it's just not. The existence of the world is not one of them. Because uh, he's Meinongian, so he thinks whenever you talk about something, it has to be somehow, except in the case of absolute claims. There's absolutely nothing for response to those. But if you say the, the circle is round, sorry, the square is round, mm -hmm. uh, that's certainly false in one respect, but it is an object in the domain of judgment. So it, in fact, does correspond. So this is also like that term is used except there are some true contradictions, but maybe the existence of the world. Um, um, and the difference between Priest and Hegel, uh, I do like the, um, yeah, the, as you said, going back to the wire diagram stuff, and I think it has a lot of problems in some stuff too. Um, we were the kind of most formal Priest style diagrams into, into Hegel's work. And maybe you can read it out of those lectures. At least it's the case that it's the transcending of understanding. We can, we, we can take this idea that a proposition is true and false. Um, and we can see a kind of pre style dialectism, uh, uh, maybe applying with Abel to the transcending of understanding. But as you said, that's, that's correctness and incorrectness. Like you said, here's the absolute true. The absolute is absolute, the absolute is there is no absolute, true and false. As so though you have this thing and you're just corresponding and you're mm -hmm. just taking the proposition, matching it with the match. Mm -hmm. right? So that's all correctness. I think that's all right. Um, so one could kind of cash out the contradiction in terms of true truth values uh, as two T and F. Mm -hmm. But if we're talking about the negation of understanding or something like that, but if we're talking about correctness, mm -hmm. but you're right, there's an open question. About um, um, sp speculation, once we've you know, gone past understanding the values and the speculative, whether we still have that. So it's a good res uh, your response is quite interesting. It doesn't seem that you have a binary condition, like you said, at mm -hmm. this absolute level. Mm -hmm. And the question is if falsehood is lack of self correspondence and truth is self correspondence, the truth of contradiction seems to imply that. 
the lack of self correspondence that you felt so that was really good. So I'm 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 open to actually rethinking this position, as saying that for Hegel's um, account of the truth of contradiction, especially as regards to the absolute, that falsehood is inherent, but at least negation has to be. Yeah. So this is this is where things get tricky, and why we're waiting for your book is that the absolute must be absolute mm -hmm. and not be absolute. It must be absolute and be negative. So you, you need A is A and A is not B uh, to have that contradiction. Do you need true and false? For me also, I think our conversation has been, well, maybe we don't, maybe you're right, everything's just true. But as long as, as long as we're committed to the, everything is only true and not false, as long as you're committed to the fact that those truths involve the affirmation of the content and the affirmation of its negation. And that for me is the essential way. The question is whether T and F are tracking the affirmation and negation anymore, or uh, what exactly is going on with the relation of falsehood and negation at speculative level. And that's what I'm interested in following up and thinking through. And certainly like the book doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't sufficiently Mm -hmm. Work out the relation of negation also the relation of truth and false mm -hmm. um, I hope that makes some sense what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it may turn out that there is like the truth of contradiction is the self correspondence and lack of self correspondence. And that's T, that's T and F. But it might make more sense to preserve the negation, but not the falsehood. Okay. Just one comment. Yes. I, I was thinking, can you? Maybe one of the main difference between Graham dialectism and your dialectism, yeah. our dialectism, yeah. is that the negation is not inter interdefinable with falsity. Yeah, that's what I'm. Mean. But then the problem we, is to define it. Since yes, in the tradition, exactly. negation is tra is traditionally exactly. defined yeah. um, exactly. uh, with uh, yes. on the basis of exactly. falsity. We need to find another way exactly, exactly. to and define exactly. negation. And that's the slipperiness, right? Is that when I want to communicate, say, to someone like Graham, then you translate it into the terms of the understanding. Mm -hmm. You put the T's and the F's, right? And then you you mm -hmm. make you you equalize the falsehood in negation and then communicate yourself. But this is that's part of the trouble. What is the correlative term there? We need a new language for that. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a that's an open question. So that, that, that's been helpful to talk about that. As long as we have, and I think I, this relates to the issue of contradiction. When Hegel talks about contradiction in that chapter, you agree with this, but I agree with that. Uh, but I went back through it and was trying to reiterate that, reconstruct that content. And he does formulate that PNC as that the A is consistent with itself. Mm -hmm. The A cannot be A and not A. But then what's interesting is then the contradiction that happens is a, is the a not being itself is the a is a as not a. and so the contradiction shows up as self contradiction this is why i cited this previous calls it absolute self contradiction so the violation of the principle is actually a self contradiction shows up as absolute as absolute as sorry, as self contradiction because it's violating a principle that says concepts should be self consistent so the, the, the PNC formulation is that the concept should be consistent with itself. And then the violation is that it is inconsistent with itself. Um, and so that's why I wanted to immediately say that you have a contradiction is self-contradiction. That's already maybe a little different in, in other ways than Graham's. Some of the articles are finishing. Okay, those are the hard things out of the way. Let me talk <laughs> out of the way. Let me let me talk about non-Western ideas. So now I get to promote one of my favorite schools, which is Kyoto School. The Kyoto School is amazing. The Japanese tradition of the 20th century. Uh, the main thinkers are Nishida, Nishitani, Ueda, and Tanabe. And more or less all of them affirm that there are true contradictions and that the absolute is nothing. So being is nothing, and this is a true contradiction. And they draw not only on the German idealists, they draw on Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel, or all three of them. Different thinkers draw on different ones, but they also draw on Taoism. 
because Taoism has this amazing tradition that thinks of nothing as a power. Nothing as a, as a power of negation. Hegel has this idea that, well, the labor of the negative, but Taoism has the power of absolute nothingness. So what you see in my Japanese philosophy is the synthesis of the Taoist idea of nothing as power, and then the German idealist idea of Hegel's idea of the power of the negative. And uh, it's some of it's problematic because of the German and Japanese alliance, and some of the political writings are problematic, uh, to say the least. So one has to be aware of that. But a lot of the theoretical, logical, and metaphysical stuff, uh, I think, would very much be amenable to what I'm doing here, and not out of the sphere. And I actually think that if you think back to like Taoist thinking, you know, a lot of Zen Buddhist thinking, I would have to use different language. The claims about the all encompassing and the absolute, mm -hmm. using my language, I don't think are totally uh, unjustified. Mm -hmm. I think, at least with a lot of the Asian traditions that I'm interested in, Mm -hmm. There's not only like a real opportunity for dialogue, but actually uh, inspiration. So, again, I'm not an expert on a lot of indigenous philosophies, so I have no opinion. I think, especially Latin American philosophies or African philosophy. So, my my expertise is more in Asian traditions. Mm -hmm. But I'll be very interested to see how that happens. Mm -hmm. But I guess I am also uh, I am also very open to the idea. That given this presentation, these various ways in which human beings are thinking themselves in the whole should have a place in the story. In yeah. the Hegel story, they don't. And sometimes it's like that's very unjustified. Like he doesn't understand the whole story. He somehow thinks that they never got there. You know, so that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. And one can't just rehearse it and say it's already done. This, it's not. Probably also the language that I'm most comfortable with is Christian language. So I just use that for you. But it's it's just my tradition. But I definitely don't mean it to be exclusive. But I can see it Yeah, just a comment, but I just yeah, I'm, this is another open question. Um any other things from your comments that I should go into person with those as well. Um yeah. It sounds a little egotistical. I say I'm trying to put myself at the center. I don't want to, yeah. But I I do want to show the relevance of things, you know, and I also um I definitely want to yeah, be thinking systematically, not just historically. And I guess my real interests are really as in the okay, back to the dualism and syllogism thing. All right, yeah, thanks so much for those comments. I think I addressed that. Um, so first the dualism, then the syllogism question. I think I was too upset at uh, Robert Brandon Green, so I just went a little too far into <laughs> anti-influence, anti-syllogism rhetoric. But let's start with the, the dualism. So the first point is that uh, if the concept is not true in virtue of itself, but true in virtue of something else, where you say that really what we have here is not um, the concept that is responsible for logical natural action, but it's responsible, say, for its logical being, but not some other kind of being, then you do have a problem. Then you're inevitably doing something. So I definitely think, like Robin, Robert Pippin, Robert Pippin's reading probably is dualistic, Brown's reading ends up being dualistic, Brandon's readings are dualistic. I think when you don't have this kind of uh, monistic singularity where the conflict is responsible for its own existence and the existence of these other forms, you end up with dualism. Now that doesn't mean that my own position escapes it. It could be that in fact, this is a problem for Hegel himself. Uh, but at least if you think of the concept as true in virtue of itself, in principle, dualism shouldn't be the case. Then how? Then one could ask, well, how do you evade it? How do you avoid it? When there clearly are uh, forms of universality that are not self particularized. So my first answer to that question was that the concept, in virtue of its self particularization, is um, alienated from itself, outside of itself. That's also why formality has a place in Hegel. So everyone says Hegel can't be formalized. Well, of course it can, because it has a formal dimension. If you exclude the formal completely, it's not an absolute account. Now, it's not merely formalizable, 
but the formal has a has an essential place. That's why Hegel even says abstraction is the soul of the concept, and he even calls it non-conceptual. Abstraction is the soul of the concept, and he even calls it non-conceptual. So what you have in this conceptual self-development is a process whereby the concept must be other than itself. The self-particularizing concept must posit itself as not self-particularizing to be what it is. And that's exactly what you see in empirical determinations, or determinations that are not self-particularizing. So what I want to say is, first, on this account where we think about self-particularization as inherently self-contradictory, what you end up with are content. The content of the system right, is going to, in, 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 you could say, uh, going to include the positing of determinations that are not self-particularizing. And it's not just empirical notions, but also quantity. And the notion of quantity, which seems to have luminous application, unlike men or uh, you know, water, where is quantity itself a quantity? So, no, it doesn't seem to be self predicative in the same way that the others are. But you'll notice that Hegel rails against quantity as a method doing philosophy for good reason. But somehow it needs to have a place in the system, or else it isn't absolute. So even at the level of quantity, you have this kind of self externality happening at the absolute logical level. There's no reason it can't also happen at the level of empirical determinations. So I think that the logic I've laid out can, in principle, account for the structure of those entities and that, that way of thinking, given that they exist. <laughs> the latter bit for me is the trunk. If I want to think with Hegel, I want to avoid the dualism when I say there are concepts and then something makes them exist, naturally and spiritually, not the concept, but something else. I want to avoid that because then Hegel's philosophy is not a philosophy of the absolute. That's very good for the more Anglo-American reader who doesn't, understand, who doesn't understand Hegel's concern for the absolute. They're obsessed with the empirical. They've got everything backwards. But there's still a problem. Uh, the problem is, this is something that, that I'm struggling with. I'm going on too long. <laughs> I'm struggling with in my new book, which is how can Hegel account for particulars that are not concepts? If I'm right, now if I'm wrong, Hegel is not a philosopher of the absolute, or he's a philosopher of the absolute, but he fails. So again, Pippin might be right that Hegel's a failure, in this case, at least as concerns my, my, my problems. My interest <clears throat> in, in Hegel is widely diminished. But if the concept is self particular, Absolutely. We should be able to account for why there is a particular that's not a concept. Now, you can account for why there's nature, why there's um, a, a domain of existence that is not reducible to logic through logic's self referential self negation. You say logic itself is logical, and logic itself appears within logic. But if logic appears within logic, logic exceeds logic. And then you have what? Logic that exceeds itself, or that is outside of itself. And this happens to be nature. Nature is that which one could say comes to be when logic negates itself. Well, first it is logical, and through that logical nature of logic transcends logic. And this is nature. So we have, one could say, a conceptual domain like in nature. We can know it through concepts, but it's not reducible to nature. So I think my own account, too, with this logical self-referential predication can give you a story about why there is nature. It's not logic. It depends on logic. Is logic self overcoming uh, and self negation? But that doesn't account for why there are particulars that are not concepts. This is still a problem for me. Why are there particulars that are not concepts of nature and spirit? Especially all the particulars in logic are also concepts. There is no particular in logic per se that's not a concept. So, how do you go from the particulars that are concepts to the particulars that are not concepts? You get the non conceptual from the conceptual, but this is still the concept of the non why is there anything that's not a concept? I don't know why or how there could be on my own. But then when I look to other readings, they say, well, they're just given. They're just given. That seems more reasonable than what I'm saying. But if they're just given, then the instantiation of concepts in those givens relativizes the concept. And the concept isn't true in version of itself. And it's no longer true that the concept is the sole element of its own existence. You have to revise it, and you have to be honest that you're revising, it, not reporting. It. So those are my worries about dualism. It's a great question because it like speaks to the heart of my own 
one set of complaints I have against Abel himself. And I think actually all the readings that we have land us in this problem. So this is my kind of theoretical answer. And somehow, I'm, I'm actually really interested in if people have other solutions that can help find a reading that doesn't end up either sacrificing the absolute nature of Hegel's system or preserving it, but at the cost of not being able to account for why they are One One uh, thinker that wasn't mentioned was Mel Lassou. And I, 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 I read enough Mel Lassou just to put him in the book. <laughs> so <laughs> my apologies to anybody who reads that. Uh, I, I, uh, I need to read more of it. But Mel also has this problem of correlations. There's a critique of phenomenology and critique of early modern philosophy that wants to think of beings as the correlates of conscious subject. And if you think of the logic as something which only exists if there's a subject that knows it, or that these categories develop because there's a subject thinking, you end up having to deal with, with Mel Su and this problem of. Well, this problem of correlations, how can there be facts that antecede human subjects or facts that antecede human subjects? Maybe his critiques aren't any good, but you at least have to deal with it. But if you read logic the way that I'm doing, which makes logic independent of human subjectivity, you don't have that problem. Well, logic or God, God's thought before the creation is antecedent to any conscious human subject. So, you don't have the same problem with correlation. You have the ancestor facts. Logic themselves are ancestor facts, just as much as nature. So I also think that this reading of logic, where you don't make logic dependent on a human knower, can respond to problems Melissa raises. But if you make logic dependent on a, uh, on a human subject, then you have a, then you have problems. I think logic actually has both. One, there's the logical categories developing in the room. Then there's Hegel knowing. So <laughs> there's the categories developing. That's the atemporal and historical stuff. Maybe my neoplatonic stripes are showing. And then there's Hegel knowing it. Logic becomes science. Logik becomes Wissenschaft. And I think Wissenschaft and Logik and Logik are not necessarily the same. But that logic itself comes to exist as science when Hegel thinks God's thoughts out. The syllogism bit, I acquiesce completely. I've already acquiesced to Alessandro the Son, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who also raised this critique in his, um, uh, in his review. Sometimes it's good just to acquiesce. So on the one hand, syllogism understood as inference, something a subject does, uh, this is the way often Brandon thinks of it, is a kind of vanity. That's what Hegel says. It's, argumentation is an exercise in vanity. Philosophy shouldn't be an exercise in vanity that I give an argument, you respond. I, that's just that's pure vanity. And in that way, philosophy doesn't perceive the syllogism, doesn't perceive my argument, doesn't perceive my inference. But there's another sense of syllogism, which is scientific. And that side um, I don't develop in the book. I do point out that it does, syllogism does develop out of judgment, and that it is part of the inherent self-development. So that is implicitly acknowledged. But it is true that the rhetorical uh, the rhetorical side of the book is to push against the idea that philosophy proceeds or thinking or reason proceeds through syllogism and inference. This is also because I'm trying to, as it were, separate Hegel's story and reason from the inferentialism and the kind of uh, approach to Hegel from someone like Brandon. But that shouldn't obscure the fact that syllogism is an essential moment of the concept. And in fact, is yeah, through the collapse of the end terms and middle terms, we get up to here. And so, certainly, syllogism ought to and can express scientific time. And that needs to be acknowledged. As long as we're clear that, that that's not the same as something like a subject making inferences about the state of things or something like that, which I don't think is the same thing. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm acquiescing <laughs> to, to you. It was a very nice point, and also um, Al, uh, Alessandra wrote a review in which she also makes this point. Very astute. Any other comments? I also had objections against myself. <laughs> also, who is that person? Am I still the same one? <laughs>
but still the absolute dynamics. Uh, briefly, I don't think my arguments against Marcus Gabriel are very good in here, so I think the arguments don't work. Generally, I mean, I don't agree with them. Yeah. I think Priest's um, Priest argument that Gabriel isn't circular, I don't think it's circular, so I think that's that argument fails. I just think all the arguments are false and meaningless. And so that's what I've argued in the last year in this book with Graham and Marcus. I got the opportunity to write the postscript where I said that he's a mystic who thinks the non existence of the world is mystically defined. And I think that's the only way that you can have it. Again, for, for me, that's fine. I like mysticism. I think that that argument, if anyone who's online or here thinks that my arguments against the no world view here are very good, uh, they, they could be improved, and I've tried to improve them. I do think the Hegelian alternative that I offer in here is an alternative to Gabriel's view, and that I don't think he gives any substantial critique of Hegel that really works. So it's always an opportunity to evade whatever he's trying to do. That way. Um, no one has raised the objection in the discussion that contradictions are resolved. And usually people tell me this. They say, but Greg, the contradictions get resolved. They, they didn't just say, but Greg, sometimes. They're resolved in the end. There's a long story about this. I won't talk about it because I've already gone way over. We don't know how much time left to talk. But um, one of the things I'll say that if, that's, if, if that means that there are, in the end, in the end, whatever that means, there are no true contradictions. I think Schlegel, and the 20th century is right, whether it's Levinas or Nico, that Hegel returns to the abstract when they reform again. And uh, ends up with a one sided, well defined absolute that isn't truly absolute. I think that's a wonderful argument to set up Hegel to be completely demolished by the 20th century and the French, French traditions. And I would be curious that if you think the consistent Hegel, can respond to those objections, what if it would be? I have other comments about that, but I, I haven't heard from this complaint yet, so maybe I'll see. Yeah, so thanks a lot. Sorry that I actually did the work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, yeah. uh, Gregory. Sure. Uh, Gregory, you're welcome. Thank you. Forty minutes over time and ten minutes over the booking of the room. Uh, <laughs> no one came to get out yet. Uh, if there's one or if someone has a question, we can allow maybe five minutes, uh, or we can. I'm leaving the choice to you. We can also take the discussion bit to our lunch spot. So if someone feels compelled to ask a question now, we can have a brief Q&A now, or we just need the Q&A at lunch. We can do both. <laughs> <laughs> we can steal five minutes. OK, I had a question, but I'm glad to save it for lunch. OK, uh, okay then right, thanks, thanks again. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you.